Are you looking for a delicious, fun, and easy dinner? Something that the entire family will be obsessed with? Well, we are excited to announce a brand new partnership with... Chutzpah Dumplings. Michael, I made these dumplings for my family. You heard that right. Me made these dumplings for all my kids of all ages. And you know what? They devoured them in like five minutes. These dumplings are 100% plant-based, have nine grams of protein per serving, and take less than 10 minutes to make. Whether you fry them, boil them, or steam them, just put the flame on and wait for them to float to the top. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Their first flavor, Bubby's Dumplings, reminds me of homemade Shabbos brisket. It's really, really good. Bursting with flavor. Super easy to make. You can order them right now at eatchutzpah.com where they will be delivered frozen right to your door. And for a limited time, you can use code Ami's House to get 15% off your first order. That's A-M-I-S-H-O-U-S-E for 15% off at eatchutzpah.com. <laughs> husband does his thing in a cup and then they wait till the time month when the wife is ovulating. ovulating they rush her to the clinic and then they put a puerto rican guy's sperm in her <laughs> 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 and he's like he's like listen i'm with it like my kid's gonna come out pitching 90 with placement <laughs> check one that's hilarious i wonder why he hasn't uh talked about it on the podcast it's probably personal this is like it's so funny that he's super personal i'm sure, yeah, he could, I'm sure but... you could talk about it once you like successfully are but he's talking about it he's talking about it in public yeah 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 i, I don't know it's like different in a clip that lives yeah. forever he's gonna be such a funny dad comic when he has yeah. a kid yeah yeah i think man. one of the reasons like See, seth that, rogan know. what i said Mirza Hashem on the pod so you yeah don't care. um <laughs> hey think seth rogan they they that dad trouble having kids no i was just saying something else. seth rogan wrote in his book now i've never actually seen some of his stand-up i don't know how good a stand-up he, he was doesn't really do stand-up but he writes in his book when he started doing stand-up that yeah. his teachers taught him not to think about something funny when you write stand-up. Don't try to like make jokes. Think about mm-hmm. something extremely painful and then yeah. write about that. And painful things are funny. So it could be Schultz. Like, it's literally too painful for him. Mm. I'm speculating here to talk about it at a pod on a serious level. Yeah. But that is what comes out in his comedic presence. Right. Seth Rogen said to Seinfeld, you ever see somebody who's like, I thought I wanted to be a stand-up until I met someone who really wanted to be a stand-up. You ever see, like, you hear the stories of boxers who go into the ring? They're like, I thought I wanted to be a professional boxer. And then I got into the ring with someone who really wanted to be right, a professional yeah. boxer. And I realized, I don't want to be a boxer. <laughs> what does that mean? Meaning, it, I see what it takes and I see what it does to people. Uh, and this guy's more hardcore about this than I am. Right. Because it takes a lot. Like, he said this on Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Jerry. Like, you know, for people who are stand-ups, there's there's a pain threshold you need to be able to withstand. And like like a boxer who gets and says, yeah, I want to be a boxer. And then he takes a few hits. Right. And he goes, holy crap, I don't want to be a boxer. Um, so, yeah. but yeah, we were. But Joe yeah. Apatow also told um, on that, on the pain thing, he told, um, who's the guy who wrote Forgetting Sarah Marshall? I forgot his name for a Siegel? second. Yeah, Jason, Jason Siegel. He said, he said, he don't. acted it. He wrote it. He wrote and acted it. He said, he said, don't don't write a comedy. Write a serious movie. And because you're funny, it's yes. gonna be funny. They uh-huh. told they told Steve Martin the same thing about the yeah, movie he did so. with the jurors, <laughs> with the jurors that yeah, uh, cool. like, don't try. Just write. If you write it, it will come out funny. Right, so if, right. if Andrew Schultz talks about pain, it's gonna be funny. Uh-huh. Right. Because he's that's Andrew that, Schultz. That's the idea. Yeah. Forgetting yeah. Sarah Marshall happens to be a very Soto stick movie for uh, fundamental for the non Jewish audience movie for me. Yes. Yeah. Why? I like I'm obsessed with the jerk theory, not just the movie, the concept in life. Like I am a nice guy that always finished last, mm-hmm. like with girls, yeah, and things like that. And it's, I mean, you see me at like right after shows. You can't like judge someone's ex- like. I like, see I see you right now, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you can't judge someone's like game after they kill it at a I comedy club. I had trouble club. closing too in my day when I was your age. But I was actually. Do you really have trouble closing? I don't see. I that. was married a few. Yeah, I was married you... a few years when I was your age, and I still had trouble closing. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> hard once you're married. Is that what McFun Nights about? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll explain it to you when you're older. Um, I had trouble closing, not working it up, not not not. not I had good game, but closing, it's like a layup. Like that's I was not, like, that's not the way I remember it from high school. Because I always let you watch. <laughs> no, um, it's not we the had, way we you had were. an arrangement. <laughs> 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 it's not the way you remember. You're like the. Uh, no, you did fine in high school. Y- I don't know about college. Um, I was already dating who my soon to be my in eventual college, wife, which yeah, means you did well, but you can't talk about it. No, but here's the thing. No, I, 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 I think it's maybe it's all relative. Uh, 
It's yeah, well, I didn't see the ones you didn't. <laughs> or just like I, I watched the ones you didn't. <laughs> you only watched the ones that were successful. <laughs> it's it's uh it's more that like knowing what I know now about it, yeah. I think I was a wuss in a lot of ways. Um, and I think I was a uh, yeah. nice guy. Like I don't want to like be, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable yeah. doing anything, hitting on girls. Like I could I could flirt well, and I had good well, game in the right context. There's two parts of these like this like, conversation. It's yes. like the game of like hitting on a girl at a bar, yes. and then like the follow up the relationship and i think the jerk theory applies more to the, the actual what relationship do you mean by the jerk theory jerk theory is basically Be a that little bit of a douche is that girls because like on an evolutionary level we know they're predisposed to be more attracted to schmucks basically mm. because 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 i'm all years ago when like we were cavemen yes so the the men that could support and sustain the next generation were right. the ones that could take down the tigers so it was more right. aggressive 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 but that doesn't male. mean jerk i actually think there's a more refined way to to talk about to like of what you're getting at that, okay. I, that i know what it is it's and i think when you're well, like for dating for guys who are like who, who struggle with this like there is a like a cute sort of teasy thing that i've noticed like over like in my lifetime like girls are attracted to because it implies that the guy is confident and what they're mostly at fundamental level attracted to is is confidence. So someone who's willing to like notice things, but also kind of lightly tease about it. Like, oh, that's why, a why nice you... therapist way of saying that they just like guys that ignore them. I think. Well, ignore is also meaning like if, that's confidence, especially yeah. for a girl that everyone's giving attention to, they will notice the one person who's not. Right. Um, but I do think there's there's a as opposed to coming to a girl and saying you're ugly. That's not going to work. Obviously but if you not. say, like, uh, why obviously? It's not so obvious. You tell the right person, you got to be a little bit of a douche. That could mean that could mean telling a girl, like, ugh, you're gross. But if you'd be like, what are you wearing? What is this? You think you could pull that off? Like, there's a very big I difference. use that line. You think, <laughs> oh, you think, oh, you think you could pull that off? No, I'm not here to give dating advice. I wasn't really in the game like you were. But, uh, but I, I noticed the difference in, like, you notice something because it means, like, you're noticing something about a girl. But you're also, like, confident enough not to be, like, not to just, like, uh... To, to let them know, like, I'm my own person, and I can, I'm, I'm, right. I'm confident enough to tease you. And there is something there in that, like, like sweet spot. Come on, you know what I mean. Yeah, I know. Michael, I just, you know sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> no, well, age matters a lot also. You're 20, how old are you now? 27. Yeah, so as you start getting older, I think women start uh, responding differently to, to the jerk that, thing. That's what they say, yeah. So? I, think, like, you're, I think you're totally right in high school and, like, college. The jerk thing does do well. But like you see those guys age and they're still jerks and mm. like no one wants to go near them. Interesting. Um, You're scaring Dobie back. No, because no, because because. But it's also I girls that right. say single and have been yeah. burned by so many jerks are more yeah. are right. adapted to that. There, there's a certain like you can't be so eager and vulnerable, off the bat. I think you're right. I don't. Th I don't think women respond so well to that too. Not even just eager and vulnerable. I don't think they respond to like sensitivity so well. Or oh, if you're like mm -hmm. actually, like super nice to them early on, they're like, oh, he's too easy. Like that. Like. I, where, where I, are you meeting these girls? Uh, you, you know, just shul and stuff, yeah. <laughs> all over. This will be a good time to introduce our guest, ladies oh, and sorry, gentlemen. Yeah. And that's okay. No, we, we we started organic here. We are here with a friend of mine, comedian, stand-up comedian, uh, and co-host of the Mislabeled podcast, which we have a little bit of history with. <laughs> No, no, no. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> Who was kind enough to have me on as well, and we're we're all friends in this space, ladies and gentlemen. Dovi Newberger in the house at Ami's house. Welcome. Thank you so much. This is literally an honor. I interviewed Mark Norman the other day, yeah. and uh, I have to say, Ami Kozak, much more exciting for me. Hey, hey comedy, <laughs> comedy. Hey, well, Mark Norman, you know he's somebody, but here, hey, comedy. Hey, I'm do actually it, Kevin Hart. Yeah. Do a Mark Norman shout out to Travis Judah. Oh, Mark Norman. Okay, yeah. so as Mark Norman, I will point out that uh, a great company here is not that queefy, and they sent <laughs> us some um, swag in Old Milvato <laughs> from a company called Tribe of Judah. That's for the Hebes, for the Jews. What's the wait? What's the background <laughs> behind this? This uh, such great a company, Tribe of Judah, sent us some clothes. I hey. My Ayeka. Oh, Ayeka. Yeah. That's what it says. It's real inside baseball stuff, but mm. if you if you know, you know. I right. think they're awesome. So you know, you different... know why the Jews have like a secret society? They're taking over the world. <laughs> the tunnels. Up oh, in the tunnels. Oh, watch out. It could get queefy. Uh, <laughs> use the promo code AMI10 when purchasing your next piece, and you will get some uh, some good swag here. AMI10, I'm Kevin Hart. Uh, Tribe of Judah, shout out. How's that? That was great. Hey! That was great. I actually have different corporate Jewish sponsors. Oh, tell me that. You want to tease? 
okay. Neil Bodner. Oh, I great love friend those of mine. Guys. Mm. Yeah. Guy, yeah, I love you on it too. So I'm sure Tribe of Judah uh, is hating a shout out to a competing brand. Oh, I apologize. That's yeah. okay. Uh, that's that's okay. okay. Good Yonah, friend of yours. I like your, you got good Jewish well, back too. I want to shout out Yonah. He just put out a line of jam band t-shirts with like the state of Israel yes. outline in it. Like, with fish, like fish Grateful and Grateful Dead. Really yes. cool stuff. Um, I'm going to get one, I think. Something about you, like I like I, I know I just met you, something about you yeah. said like you used to be a deadhead, like kind of fish. I used to be. Am, yeah. You yeah. were running the, sh- the, the Shabbos RV at the fish festivals. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the kind of map. Um, yeah, no, I still go. We went, we were there together. I know, and, he missed uh, one of my uh, shows for the garden. Mm. Yeah. Oh, oh the, the New Year's show. Yeah, the New Year's show. It's quite a show. Oh, I did, right? Yeah, yeah. the Bergenfield. It was a great show, though. Yes, I want to hear about that. And I want to hear more about you as a comedian and a producer in this space. Um, yeah, fire First away. of all, how do you get girls? Tell me. <laughs> you were saying it's sure, but what do you what do you do, Dovey? Tell me. Is this your Dovey impression? No, <laughs> no, I have a different one. Dovey's like, so I mean, I want to do a show. I want to do it at, on Mars, and I want to bring everyone from Bergenfield. <laughs> you kind of got to go there and just be like. But did I would I sell out that show with people from Bergenfield? Absolutely, and you would do it at the American Dream Mall, and I want to take everyone from the American Dream Mall, and I want to give them another bris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's my Dovey. Um, yeah. So how do I? I, I don't get girls. Mm. Um, mostly. We well, were talking about how you have trouble closing, which people would find hard to believe because you're a cute guy. What's going on? Yeah. Wait, let's, let's start at the beginning. What's your background with girls? You went to, like, yeshivish, yeshivish schools, right? Oh, uh, not necessarily. So I got I complicated background. Mm. Like, you know, a lot of, like, there's a lot of, I would say, in, like, the yeshiva system, more modern families that are, like, kind of fashivish, like, you know. Fashivish. Like, like Shaitel's in the Five Towns, Bikinis on Vacation type of families. Oh, man, my favorite album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So and they sent to like yeshiva school. <laughs> Yoga pants and shaitels in the five towns. <laughs> That's your. We should do a country album about this. Yeah. Yoga pants and shaitels driving in the car, getting coffee on. Crawfords. What, what's the avenue? Central. Central <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> yeah. But my family is like the opposite. Okay. Um, in that my dad was is a big rabbi in a modern Orthodox community, so yeah. my family is probably much more culturally yeshivish than mm-hmm. anyone I grew up with and very religious. But more so than the surrounding community that it that it served? For sure. Yeah. I mean, my dad's a rabbi with a long white beard, I think. Right. But, and uh, like I, I, my, the first time I saw, I say this as like, uh, not to like be dramatic, but just to explain, like the first time I saw the ocean, yeah, I was at a beach when I was 20. Oh, he, yeah. said, he said ocean. So he could have said so many things. The yeah. first time I saw... Yeah. The ocean. Literally. You were 20. You don't live very far from the ocean. You didn't grow up very far. We didn't go to the beach. I didn't go to Broadway shows growing up. And like my siblings are going to like watch this and be like, you're being like the classic drama queen. Like try Mm -hmm. to like paint yourself as like my name is Asher Lev. And I'm I'm not. But I I grew up with this unique dichotomy. You saw like like, the Little Mermaid growing up though and stuff. No, I saw like I went to modern schools. I went went to Y&J and MTA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I was on the basketball team. Like I was in a modern world. Yeah. But at home. It, Capital it, Orthodox lowercase M for yeah. modern Orthodox. No TV. <sighs> Monitor type, you know that th- that type? No. So like we had like two through thirteen. Like <laughs> if we uh, basic cable, whatever's like happens. no, not even like there was not a, basic cable. I'm literally sorry. Literally like a, the free like a dry cleaning hanger yeah, out of yeah, one yeah. side of the antenna. Yeah. And like. Rafi had to have his leg up on the radiator while one sibling was doing a handstand in order right. for us to get the Jets on right. Sunday. Yeah. And like, like at a certain, like literally on like fourth and goal, like the, the TV would just cut and we'd be like, who moved their foot? Like you messed up the whole connection. So this was like what you talk about as like you were poor, rich Jew. What was the thing you said? Rabbi about? poor. Rabbi, Rabbi poor. poor. Explain yes. that again. So Rabbi poor is like to the rest of all rich. You're still in the top two, 3% uh. of income earners in the country. But, Poverty and people call me out when I say I grew up poor, like you didn't grow up poor. Yeah. I believe poverty is by definition a phenomenon of relativity, mm-hmm. meaning poor people in America are not, like even in the inner city, are not poor compared to poor kids in Africa. Poor kids in Africa aren't poor compared to sweatshops in China. And even the people in sweatshops in China have healthcare way beyond the richest people that lived 150 years ago. So mm-hmm. poverty just means a, a relative phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you grew up in a modern Orthodox, Community at a certain point, at the bottom, there's poverty. Yeah, there, yeah there's yeah. destitution. But, yeah, 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 yeah. But I hear what you're saying. Like so, I talk about in the set, how like my friends would, um, my friends would like obviously go away winter break, and like my parents would say like we couldn't go in, away winter break because like my mom taught in YU, my my dad taught in YU, and mm-hmm. I had one winter break, and my mom taught in a basic had a different winter break, and yeah. then like last year I found out same winter break. The whole time. <laughs> 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 but that was in a Starbucks with like a pile of farm writing yeah. like his say for us on Hedron. Right. Yeah. Um, interesting. So what do you think? Do you think you found your path to, 
I mean, we talk about like how in our world, in the uppercase modern, lowercase orthodox world, right. even that creative pursuits are not the most encouraged thing. Um, they're there. You can indulge a little bit, but like you, even after watching your interview with Mark Norman talking about it, you're like a more than a typical like, hey, I want to try stand up. You're like a student of comedy. And yeah. I will tell you this. When I first saw you get up, you said you had only been doing it like you were in your first year. The first time we played together was at the mo, the our first mo, play date. Mo date. Yeah, yeah it was at the play. Mo date event. Was it the first time I saw you get up? Was Mo date? Yeah, was, absolutely. Was, um, yeah, it was at Stand Up New York, and I had been doing it about and, eight months at that point. Yeah, eight months. Okay, and you got up, and instantly I was like, "This guy sounds five years in." Thank you, I appreciate. I that. will say that I had the same response when I saw you for the first time. Really, probably Even, not much after that. Even for a comfortable performer to get up and do stand-up in particular, it's not for the faint of heart, it takes a certain amount of time and grind to sort of refine one stage voice that didn't seem to be an issue for you. So Tell me the truth. So, no, <laughs> I, stand-up was, that, that was only a couple months in. Mm -hmm. No, I know it was that amount of time, but how does it feel? I, I mean, I had done a lot of, like, offer of speeches and Shabbat Rachos and stuff like that. I was like that friend. The so. Jewish training. Yeah. Yeah. So I was used to it in that sense. I'm the youngest of six. My yeah. family, I say this all the time, very cliche line. But like, if you didn't have something funny to say growing up, you didn't get to talk sure. at all. Yeah, I'm It was like we had child. a very rippy culture. House is flying. Six kids, but really thousands of kids because my parents were parents to hundreds of couples. And were you making people laugh in and out of the house? Was that a thing? Oh, Dovi, do your thing. Was it Was it something that they put you front and center on early days? Uh, my style's like more sarcastic. I right. don't know if it's like on the, like I'm not like a like class clown type, mm -hmm. right? But. Pause. I would. I just went to like uh, my nephew's bar mitzvah and all of his, all my parents' old friends were there and I was suddenly reminded as to how I became an entertainer. Right. Oh my all God. of their old friends that I grew up as a child around just kept walking up to me. We're going to get a show? Come on, dude. What have you done? Dude? You haven't said anything yet. Oh, Everyone else. Oh I'm like, I'm the uncle, so it's I'm not. The, literally the worst part. It's of parents, history. grandparents. I'm not a featured speaker. They're like, when you're doing something. And I'm like, they didn't all have accents. One person did. But they were. <laughs> what voice is that? I, I won't. I won't all name comedic names. bits are. And I want to talk about this because you'll appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate this. Are a synthesis of many stories. In your yes. Life. Yes. So I, I and then and then I said to my wife, I'm like, now, you know where I come from in a way that she hadn't seen in a long time where it's like, so are we going to get something from you? No, I'm going to do a little something. We want to hear it. We want to hear it. So back in the day, like in the Catskills and like where, where, where we had a house growing up in the summers and vacations, my parents' crew, it was like, all right, I'm, I'm, come here, come here for a second. Do, do the thing. Do the accent it, it, of the bus do driver. Do the accent. Yeah. Do the thing. Do, do imitate this person. Imitate that person. I would just stand in the room and wow and pizzazz my parents' friends with impressions. He can really do it. He gets it from you, Leon? To my parents, I I'm not as good, but he gets it from me. It was That's what the environment was. Yeah. So you're saying in your house growing up, it had, you, you were more like behind the scenes funny? Well, every single, I, my family does not think I'm funny. Every person in my family thinks they're the funniest yeah, one uh, in the family. Yeah. And like none of them will actually, I'll use a Yiddish word here because I don't think, that, like certain Yiddish words just don't translate. Mm. So there's a word, Fargin, which I guess means to acknowledge or like, Use it in context. Uh, so they wouldn't forgive me that I'm like indulge. Uh, yeah, they would. They just like it. That's it. They, yeah, it's indulge. I, I, I don't think it's indulge. I translated. I it. They wouldn't indulge. indulge you. I think knowledge it's more. is pretty good. It's like I'll give you an example. Like the word schlep, you could you can't translate that to English. What would you say? Carry? No. Schlep. It doesn't drag. It, it's in between acknowledge and indulge. It's yeah, and then it's like they wouldn't be like. Ah. Someone, they would yeah. be like, all right, Dovi's enough, yeah. enough of you. Yeah. They if someone like asked them, it's said like, so Dovi's doing comedy. You're like, okay, he's not doing whatever. Like uh, they would give one of those. Uh, it's cute. It's cute. It's cute. Yeah, yeah. Discourage. They would. They wouldn't encourage. It's a phase. It's a phase. It's a encourage. Phase. Acknowledge. Indulge. Yeah. It's in the the trifecta. Now they actually all come to shows, which is really nice. That's how it is, is your man. Dad funny. So if you ask like his like Balabatim and like people from IU, they'll say, "Oh, he's so funny. He's hilarious." But the bar is so low because they're not <laughs> expecting anything right, right, right. for like a very prestigious rabbi to make the stupidest joke. And would I you, write his best lines. Would you sure. have him open for you? On the road? But I have him <laughs> open for me. So I don't like, this is so funny because people get like the wrong idea. My parents are like the most supportive parents like in, in, when it comes to these things, like yeah. more so than any modern Orthodox parents would be. Um, I don't like, first, I don't, I can't have him at club shows because mm -hmm. it's beneath his cover to, to be in that environment. His respect. Um, and Your I don't, father happens to be, for people who don't know who you are watching. Sorry, my dad is, yeah. Is a very well-known pulpit rabbi and has a community and is well-known established in the modern orthodox jewish world uh yeah as a considered uh i'll quote wikipedia on this one yeah. considered one of the most authoritative on uh, jewish marital law in the in the country if you had a show at the ocean would he come 
<laughs> naughty, 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 doubling down. Um, By the way, when I was 20 and I did go to the beach, it was at 7 in the morning for a surf lesson and no one was there. What was it like? Your first time seeing the ocean. It was. I called my mom. I said, this is the craziest thing I ever saw in my life. I, I swear. It's so hard to believe. Yeah. And again, like I grew up in Teaneck. I know. That's, yeah. No, 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 ma, ma, ma. Water comes in and then it goes out. Yeah. You won't, you, you won't, it's, not, it's not like a pool. It's, it's not like a pool. The, the water goes in. It is and the most amazing out. thing you've ever seen. If you, if you, if you didn't grow up yeah. with it and you just see the ocean for the first time in your twenties, yeah. it, it hits differently. I promise. Did you cry? I didn't cry. I was like, I was, I was astonished. I just yeah. like couldn't believe there's anything like that. And it's that moment you knew you wanted to be a scuba diver, but <laughs> you changed your career path. Um, <laughs> All right, so your dad won't go to the clubs. No, but he's he's produced shows in like Jersey, and I see his dad sneak into the back and listen the back. Really? sneak out. That's so it's pretty, sweet. It's pretty That's adorable. So at Ju- no, so at Jewish shows, he would come. Like if it's going to be 100 percent clean, he would come. The thing for me is that in order, like it's, he's too distracting. He walks into a room, everyone, no one's listening to my set. Everyone's uh-huh. like, I wonder how disappointed he is, and like, and then One like, day, yeah, that derails the whole set. It's not fair to the other comedians, also. Yeah. Do you see yourself eventually? I mean, it seems like. As far as your comedy, and like I, I've had this moment too where I, I was doing a lot of stuff, impressions and stuff of people that were outside the Jewish world and getting attention from outside the Jewish world, the Gary Vaynerchuk community, the Jordan Peterson community, all that stuff. And once I started doing stand up, like I was doing clubs and people's random shows and open mics and things like that, but then also uh, the Jewish world of comedy. I thought about it like not in hierarchical terms, like, well, there's Jewish comedy, Jewish music, Jewish art, and then there's like the cool, legit stuff. More right. like, how many people, there's a lot of people who well, can Jewish do. Jewish comedy exploded in the past couple of years. Yeah, and it's like there's a lot of people that can do generic stuff, jokes about airplanes, about relationships, about kids, and I can do all that. And I'm going to try, and I try to like hack away at writing material in that world, but how many people can joke about very niche specific things in our Jewish world? How many people can joke about mincha and like, and uh, Jewish prayer and ritual in a good, authentic way. There's very few. So I lean into that, too. What's your take on the hierarchy, if there is such a thing, or the niche, niche versus right. so on, general like, comedy? On, pure, like on, on an art level, yeah. I think you would appreciate that. It's a, it, And I don't mean, like, yes, there are fewer people that can joke about that. Mm-hmm. It's less of a talent to be able to walk, like, to, to speak at your friends off rough and talk about how he got, trashed one day and like threw up and make everyone laugh at that is much less like everyone has the exact same life experiences to make to draw off that and make people laugh is less talented than walk into the comedy cellar and you have four indians over there and black people over there and asians in the back Mm -hmm. and to create a common experience where they can all (laughs) laugh sorry i was i was getting like triggered by shane gillis holding snl asians whatever no i'm I'm joking i I looked at the camera when you said (laughs) when you just named minorities Um, is it uh, you? You look at it as a talent hierarchy because well, you said you said it to Mark too on clean versus unclean. Like it's just easier to do. And I just find like when you're up there, and you got a few minutes, it's all difficult. I, no? I think, yeah, it is all difficult. But but. The, the the you have to find a more universal truth that bonds everyone in that room right. more than so. It's you know when you open up the sitter and you find the right page, it's like that's 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 less universal. It's right. it's, it's easier to land on than love or marriage or. I, I, I don't I, agree. I, I, I don't know if I agree. Saying? I think that's. I think they're different challenges. Finding funny in the specificity of this stuff, and really making it work in a way that's not low hanging fruit. Here's the thing, Ami. The, the, the struggle of comedy. Said as you my know, name. We're getting serious. Sorry, now. no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to sound like your wife. But <laughs> you know, when you hear your name, you're like something. Something. <laughs> the struggle of comedy, as you know, is not necessarily the punchline and the actual nakuda the actual point which is funny but it is to it is to set up the premise you have yeah. tw- 20 seconds to set up a premise that is basically 20 years of your life mm-hmm. so to catch people up on on 20 years of experiences in 20 seconds basically that is much easier when you're dealing with a room full of people who have the exact same life mm. right I want to talk about Jewish concepts in front of non-Jews. I want to do that mezuzah joke, that cocaine mezuzah joke. That's what I've been saying. Like, in take front of this non-Jews to the world and, and, and make take it, it relatable. to the world. But that is the challenge. That's a challenge. I don't want to lean out of like my Jewish material. I want to make it relatable. I, I just don't know if it's hierarchical. I'm not saying the challenges aren't different. Performing at the cellar for a non, for a non-affiliated crowd presents one challenge, which is that, versus an affiliated crowd that thinks they get you, and now you have to turn all this known source material into legit comedy. I, yeah. I've said this before, but I think if you guys are doing it right and you're you're performing for a Jewish only crowd, the jokes should be good and universal enough for anyone to be in there and appreciate it, e- uh-huh. even though it's so unique and specific. 
Interesting. Well, is your job to entertain the room or to entertain the world? Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's your job to. I just I, I think that's the challenge for you guys. Well, I'll give you an example. When I did a show recently, the Elon sh- uh, the yeah. the show with West Side, oh, best and they had ever. a cr- amazing, and you had a table of non Jews cracking up. One table of non Jews. That is very helpful. Because, but it, it was helpful because right. it called out where in your bits you need exposition, and so I turned to them and I actually got some stuff out of jokes I never could get. Remember when I was explaining things to them and using them as like a... a, a, you could, a that's the perfect crowd. A yeah. roof from a Jew, but that helps you really your bits because yeah. you can explain Jewish concepts to them and that's the premise for making like... You could be like, so we wave the chicken around of our, our, the head and we give it all our sins and then we kill the chicken and we eat it and get back our sins and then we give it to the fish. And like these are things you can't say in a fully Jewish crowd because they're right. like, yeah, we know what Tashlach is. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. And if you exp- over-explain to a Jewish crowd, they get insulted like, we know this. Like, stop. Right. But I just think each scenario presents different comedic challenges but the, the format is the same and the challenge is the same like find the funny like that's all that's all right. i'm saying so there is a higher you have an advantage me. to a jewish crowd but you also like have to stay away from certain things or you have to like i don't know i don't know like to me it's just it's not it's it's splitting hairs a little bit on like well it's one thing to perform and it's one thing to kill in front of an all jewish crowd it's another thing to kill at a club. It's like, is it that different? I mean, killing. I is, think it's very different. It's very hard. It's also, just very hard for me. It's a little different than you because I think a lot of like, like a lot of my early like selling out shows in mm-hmm. like Teaneck and Bergenfield and Englewood right. was that my family was very well known. I came from this yeah. basically family of rabbis. My brothers are rabbis. All my all, all my uncles are rabbis, mm-hmm. and and it was this like, wait, 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 I knew where your son is doing comedy. I got to yeah. see this. That makes it harder. I think. I thought that was cheaper. See, to so, me, in a room of people who know you. They're not more judging, pressure, but more pressure. But more, I did two shows uh, at, at Stand Up New York, and the first show was like a bringer show. Like everyone who came knew me personally. Like right, that's the one it. I hosted. The one you harder. hosted, yeah. And it was just like I could feel everyone laughing for a second, and then like, okay, let's see what else he does. Like watching me, let's see what Atlas Ami yes. does. That's harder about Jewish crowd. Second, crap yeah, second show fans who didn't know me personally, and were laughing at the material. So you're right. getting such a different read because people are like watching you do something versus laughing at the joke. I think that happens to be something else. Your first show had a lot of like old Jewish dads. Old mm-hmm. Jewish dads come to performances in general, come to comedy shows. It's like, okay, let's see what he has. Show me what you got mm-hmm. type, type of thing. Every Jewish dad at a comedy show is like, I could do this. <laughs> Turns to this, like, I just want you to know if we didn't have to pay tuition, like yeah. this would be, uh, 100%. <laughs> like, this, this, they all think that they could do it. And it was very Jewish dad vibes. I've done it enough times to know that the more familiar the crowd is with you personally, the harder the stand up is. Interesting. And the, the more they're just like neutral or fans already, like then you have a little more like, right. you know, it's a blank slate. So then they're going to project onto you this other persona that you're creating on stage and nothing else. Right. Well, I talk a lot about my parents in my sets. Yeah. So I, I find if a crowd really knows my parents, they die. Okay, yeah, sure. So, like, that helps me a lot. What's the cocaine mezuzah joke? <laughs> you did say that. You do yeah. say that. It's a great uh, It's a great joke. That's also a combination of a couple different stories, mm-hmm. some of which I can say on the podcast, some of which I definitely can't say on the yeah. podcast. But <laughs> basically, it's um, this concept, but, like, I don't – when were you – how old were you when you got married? 30. Oh, uh, so you might be able to relate to this. Yeah. I was very old. <laughs> yeah, I was 30. Yeah, so yeah. I, I find as you get older and yeah. single – the things that like your your parents will always give you instructions. My parents happen to be super gentle mm. and they're like very hands off. Mm-hmm. But the things you end up fighting with about your parents, like don't do this, don't do that, it's literally like if you knew the rest of this, I swear you wouldn't care about what we're fighting over. Like if you knew the rest of my life, like all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I have this joke where my parents come to my apartment and my dad's like look, my dad's a rabbi, he's looking at my mezuzah. He's like, Don't we listen? Like I don't like to be annoying, but <laughs> your mezuzah, it's a little low. Like it should be on the first third of the door and i'm like i'm gonna i'll move it no problem but like also there's a full bag of cocaine <laughs> inside <laughs> that is right now <laughs> and i get into if it's from crowds i'll be like like my roommate bought it he didn't take trumo off the cocaine or whatever <laughs> like, we switched vendors to an israeli cocaine guy because like we're trying to support, support the war and everything's on mr al Khai these days how's it been doing the bit killing it kills right yeah now. yeah it's I, like it's what we of, care about the mo- small minutia of things and there's a bag of coke in the mezuzah right that's a great little it's based on true stories, though. Do you say the cocaine was in the mezuzah? So, because that's a great little thing. Cocaine mezuzah. Instead that's a of great cocaine for like there. a movie. I love yeah. that. Yeah. But like, what is the joke? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. So it's been. You tried it very recently. Like you just mentioned it casually for a second. I didn't. I, I actually didn't like write that joke out and like work yeah. it through. I just tried it at, at Elon's show yeah. in Debonair. Okay. 
and it and it flew. So yeah. like I worked on it a little more, yeah. and then really developed it nicely. Are you generally pen to paper daily? Like what's I no, try to figure I this out. Like in months, I'm you haven't written, yeah. but in the beginning, building up the material, you were writing it out or typing it out, and and like, or is it like my process work out the is my process is like go on the New York City subway, see like something funny, like a homeless guy, like like coming on and asking like you, you to buy push him, you should give him a little shove, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you sorry, say, I'm a st- I'm a comedian, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you say there's a, pre- a premise here, yeah. write it down on my notes, that's notes, yeah. stand up notes, yeah. Um, like go to shul, I'll see some guy do something sunny, and then you take the notes to the Google Doc, write out, like flesh it out to like mm-hmm. all the funny jokes, all the not as much as you can. Yeah, like this concept, you take all those to an open mic, and and like from that five minutes, you'll take maybe like forty seconds. Yeah, and, and you try the premise and just talk. I probably try, try the premise with this punchline and that punchline. Yeah, and you're going to, to Goyesha open mics. <laughs> yeah, totally. The Gen- dream for Gentiles. me. How does that work? The dream the... for me is like I. I love doing Jewish shows. The dream for me is like to Wait. to be in a like comedy cellar and stuff. I love comedy clubs. So let me mm-hmm. figure this out though, because because that's what I thought about it. So so you're doing your Jewish material at at op- regular open mics and then performing it in front of Jewish. Crowds, you could do or like, you were doing. Yeah. You, have you watched like Ari Shafir's special Jew? Uh, I, I yeah. See, he literally talks about like midrash. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, went. I've seen. You know, I for all as. Much as I love stand-up comedy and stand-up comics podcasts, I watch very little stand-up comedy these days. I get oh, it. Interesting. I actually, I don't need, I don't, whatever. It's a have, different, you, have you watched Live in Austin? Shane Gillis Live in Austin? You know what? I watch, I, I think that. If I could, if I could tell you to watch okay, one special. Okay, I haven't, I haven't, yeah. If you could do me one, yeah. it's 40 minutes. Is yeah. that the Down Syndrome one where he's like, I dodged it? Yeah. Is that uh, that one? He does it in both specials. Okay. It's his yeah. first special. I think it's the greatest special on TV right now. Mm-hmm. So here, here's my take, and then we'll get back to the, the open mic thing. Mm-hmm. I think um, for the amount of stand-up specials that are going on right now, they're, a lot of them are very subpar. Yeah. Over, oversaturated market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Meaning it means nothing. It diminishes the meaning of a special. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch 10 minutes, and I'll be like, it's okay. Yeah, a lot of bad like, stuff. Yeah, totally. It's just the set. And then I'll stop watching it. So yeah. it's just the set, and we call it a special. Like the term is meaningless. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like, why are you asking me to watch for forty five minutes on Netflix? This it's like it's like I, I know you're hilarious. I love your podcast. Everyone says you're brilliant, but this stand up special is not a brilliant stand up special. I happen to find also yeah. on that point that comedy recorded. There's something that gets lost that like there's an energy to the room that's so infectious with stand up that you sort of. Like, I saw Louie live at the Forum, I think, in L.A., and, like, my cheeks were killing afterwards, and, like, the room collectively becomes this, was like... It, was it in a club or a theater? It was a theater. It was the Forum, which is, like, a huge uh, theater with a screen. i never seen a show that like at that scale for stand-up, but even in, in clubs, like, the room becomes this infectious, unified, breathing thing when the comedy is... when the comedian is killing, and when you're sitting back, and especially if a special doesn't have a good crowd mic'd up and stuff, and you're at, like, 20 minutes in, no matter how good... You're kind of, uh, yeah, at least for me, sometimes I'm like, all right, that's good. Like, I don't know. Like, unless it's, I know, I haven't watched too many to know, but like, there's something missing. Interesting. And I don't sa- like There's theaters. something that gets a little more sanitized and like just muted from just watching it on a screen. I think that's true, but I think that's why the material has to be so brilliant. Yeah. That despite that, it still stands the test of time. Like, right. You watch the old, like, Patrice, o- Patrice O'Neill and Chappelle and Chris Rock that's and true. from the 90s. It doesn't matter. That's, right, those yeah. are really the, the, the test of, like, what takes the Comedy a, Central a good joke to, HBO like... HBO specials. The HBO specials Iconic. from the 2000s and 90s. The test of what takes, like, a good joke to, like, a all-time joke is, like, the test of time, really. Yeah. Like, so many people now are making hilarious jokes about cancel culture and uh, Roe v. Wade and... And Chabad Tunnels and Cat yeah. Williams, like these are funny jokes. Mm-hmm. In twenty years, my kids aren't going to get any of those. Uh-huh. The jokes that are like uh, the timeless jokes about like airports and like relationships Patrice and O'Neal marriage, on women. Patrice O'Neill on yeah. women are timeless. So, so, to what you're saying, I think that someone could write a timeless joke about the tunnels if written properly, the same way you guys could write a timeless joke yes. about Kiddish. That anyone can get for the yes, next twenty years. hundred percent. It is so hard if, though. If the joke, if the joke is that good, and and that's what I'm saying, your challenge is mm-hmm. to be able to, to catch write that. people up on yeah. two thousand years of Jewish history yeah. in thirty seconds, because you really have thirty seconds for a premise. Well, yes, unless and, you're Louis C.K. Well, yes, and, and, no, and people have bought into you already but, as a god. But getting to the <laughs> heart of what's universal about Kiddush may not take 
20, 2,000 years of summary. Right, you whatever. Be able to what figure it, it, it's a lifetime of experience. I, I also Some. disagree with you that I, 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 you put a, maybe more emphasis than I would on one's status and clout with their audience. If Louis C.K. did two boring minutes, he would do two boring minutes, and then eventually people would be like, huh. Interesting. What? Seinfeld talks about it all the time. Maybe with musicians, the band gets up there and like, and Bob Dylan gets up and people, because of legacy and fandom, and just go for an hour and everyone's like, well, I'm watching Bob Dylan. But a comedian, I have maybe three minutes max before I lose them all, even though I'm Jerry Seinfeld. If the material it does not work, don't be fooled. I'll get right. up there so I, yeah, and I then agree. they will just go, maybe they won't admit it to themselves, but. Laughter's involuntary at a certain point, and you're just right. not going to so get them. So we could disagree about like the, if that's a minute and a half, two minutes. You have to agree that once there's a certain amount of buy-in to a comedian, yeah. they have much more leeway in how much time they have a set. Up. Like my friends ask me all the time, like, why don't you do more bits? Like, well, I'm like, because if I don't have a punchline in the first 17 seconds, no one's re- listening to the next nine minutes. I'm Dovey Newberger. No one's ever heard of me. Yeah, there's a forgiving quality to it, but I will say like – If you it, come to see – Louis C.K. at the Garden, yes. there's much more buying. You'll, even if his first three jokes bomb, you're still there for the fourth joke. Yeah, but he has to pick himself up just like you do. I'm right. t- I just... It's very different than music in that. Like one of the, my, And you'll really appreciate this because you're in both worlds. Yeah. One of the most frustrating things for me about like music versus comedy yeah. is music plays on like the nostalgic part of the brain. So you want to hear the same things all over again. Yeah. Comedy plays on the surprise aspect of like tell me a story and then like take me yeah. on a roller coaster in my brain. So like, can you imagine if like Billy Joel got to the garden, played Piano Man, and every guy was like, oh, every time with this, the same shit, every time with this guy. Like, um, no, they came to see Piano Man. I, I, right. I kind of hear you, although I I think, yes, the element of surprise is, is, is like kind of integral to funny, but I've seen people do the bit, and everybody knows it, and everyone still laughs if it's a great bit. Interesting. Yeah. I saw, I'm going to name drop here, but speaking of Billy, Billy Crystal. I was in a scene once with Billy Crystal in a movie scene where I was. We were cast as a. Bear. Um, he does movies. Okay. Yeah, he played the baby in Look Who's Talking. <laughs> was that his movie? I don't know. Look who's talking. <laughs> Billy Crystal. Was John Travolta. John Travolta yeah. could not be further. No, no. But I just remember this. And I kept remembering this. Um. Uh, Billy Crystal. It was just a random. It was a Hollywoody kind of thing. But my band was cast to play. It was in a shul. Billy Crystal's playing the rabbi. And we are the band, like the house band in like a conservative what, what, show. What movie is this? It was like an indie movie, and okay. he was cast it was at with it. Josh Gad, was that the movie? No, it was called... Oh, I don't want to blame Josh Gad, is he it? Josh Gad's um, like pretty traditional. But it was being oh, made, yeah. and he was playing the rabbi. Custom traditional family, yeah. Yeah, he was playing the rabbi, but he had this line that he had to keep Dated doing. Dated his cousin, that's why I know. Hmm. Does she look exactly like him? No. <laughs> Like, oh, I just love the idea of Dovey. He's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Josh Gad get. Uh, Is that the Frozen uh, impression? Uh, Olaf impression. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it way too many times. Anyway, Billy Crystal was just doing this scripted line, so we had to do many, many, many takes. And it was a, it was like a, you know, can't be like Jewish joke. Like he was a rabbi opening with a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not into technology. The very first time I heard the word Google, it was something I thought my grandmother used to make for Passover. And it was just like, ha But the audience kept laughing every single time, right on cue. And I know they're kind of supposed to because it's like right, they're cute to laugh. Man, and I just, in that moment, it's not stand-up and it's scripted, but I, I do think like... Are you giving an example from a scripted laughter scene? Yeah, I don't know. This is a little... <laughs> of course they're going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the I I have yeah. yes, what you're Henry. saying is true, but this is the worst example ever. <laughs> but he would vary it up. There's each... so many examples you could give. No, but he would. Th- well, there's other stand up. My point is, even in the smallest little moment, like really? he would vary it up in different ways each time and say you, it each time. And they knew the. Li- you were in a scene with Billy Crystal. Yeah. Was yeah. that the point of this? <laughs> yeah, that was it. Very cool. Um, I I just noticed they kept laughing, but not faking it. Even they were they were extras and stuff. These aren't the like these aren't the best actors. You don't think they were faking it. A little bit. Laughter. I'm just saying okay. in a stand-up audience, there's a lot more that like people kind of go with, even if they know what's coming, the laugh comes. Yeah. No, I think your example was horrible, but I agree with you. I hear you. <laughs> um, <laughs> like I've seen Elon Gold. No, no, wait, have, wait, wait. And then, and then, and then actually John Travolta. And more then John Travolta. Can... Yeah, we know you're in How to Train a Dragon, Jason Bateman. <laughs> so then I did this things. movie. I did this, yeah. So Jason Bateman was there and he was just like massaging my shoulders. No. He's I like, love that cool movie, on, by the way. This is where I leave you. I, I just it. remember kept being like, how is he? Every single time he delivers this one line, everyone keeps laughing. And he, he like changes it. And he just kept doing the little variations, making people laugh on cue, even though they knew it was coming. 
So I haven't seen too many stand-up acts that do that, but people used to talk about Bill Cosby, and uh, that's... Uh, uh, don't ruin that joke. But people said, please that do is, the dentist bit. You know, please do the dentist bit. Seinfeld, right. do that bit. I love that yeah, bit. That's true. And they still have, tell me a funny story. You're I'm, talking about like the top 1% of comedy. I've heard podcast clips, and there's a Joey Diaz clip, and he tells this story with Rogan and Segura, and every once in a while... Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> it's so right. filthy, but it's like... Uh, As Joey Diaz. He's like, I went outside, I took a shit on my neighbor's lawn, okay? <laughs> My, and I went inside, I ran back, and you even have so much sushi, you just gotta get it out, Joe Rogan. You're like, don't do a great Joey Diaz. But like, my wife came home, like Patrick my wife came also. home, and she goes, were you outside today? <laughs> he just tells this, inc he just incredible stories. After you heard that, you call me. You're no, right. there are certain, I, I there are the certain bits which I, which I can. It'll get me every time, well, every and time. I know what's coming. But I, I don't know if you know the Andrew Schultz radiator bit. I, I watch that like once a week. So there you go. You're proving what, my point. What's the radio bit? And I've met oh, Andrew. Andrew, to Andrew and I have had drinks many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, now you're becoming the David Bushevkin and Stephen A. Smith. By the so. way, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> Andrew Schultz, people don't think it's a Jewish name, but it's a Yiddish of the Shabba. Um, I just think, I hear you, but it's closer to music than you think. Obviously, it's slightly different. Music, people want that nostalgia quality, but sometimes with a great bit, if it's so good, you need a, like there's different challenges, different things. With, with music, you actually have to like, you know, the learning curve is insane right. of what you have to do to perform no, music go, on stage. Well, you know my story. I told you Louis C.K. had a French girlfriend mm. a couple of years ago, and yeah. he said he used to go see her perform stand-up comedy. You were with Louis. Yeah, yeah, I traveled with Louis because yeah. he's very lonely. <laughs> um, and no, he said he would go see her perform in French and be cracking up, and he doesn't understand a word of French. And he, and he was saying— Well, he was trying to get action. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> these are the two worst proofs of all time. No, no, no. He, no. he was saying there's a musicality rhythm to comedy that what it almost has nothing to do with the words. Right. It's just funny. It just is. I always the, describe to people the way a joke works. There's a structure to a joke. Mm, what, and what is it? Be. It's very similar to a roller coaster. How does a roller coaster work? The builder, the engineers of the roller coaster take you, are telling you a story. That They're was saying, so Jewish. How does the roller coaster work? <laughs> I'm just saying. It is. So, how does the roller coaster it's work? It's going this way. It's going this way. So, your, so your brain and body adjust. Yeah. That, like, I'm going up a thing or whatever. And then at the last second, it does a twist in a whirl and you're not expecting it. And the, and that, like, triggers the sensors in your brain to tell you to be excited. And that's the whole phenomenon of a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. A joke, in many ways, is very similar to that. You, you're telling the audience a story. So, like, my first joke ever, ever I told on stage was about, like, how I'm wearing a yarmulke, I'm on stage, so and it wasn't a fully Jewish audience. They know like I'm obviously an Orthodox Jew, and I'm telling like I just moved in with this girl. Mm. And I was like, you moved in with a girl. I'm like, first time in my life, I moved in with a girl, and we're fighting nonstop. And like we loved each other before I moved in, but then like I moved in, and like now we just hate each other. And all my friends are just saying like, you gotta drop this girl, like move on, like she's not good for you. And I'm like, listen, like we fight a lot, but like my mom's been a big part of my life for like. <laughs> the, so what? What's the joke there? Is that I was telling what's a story. The and then, I, and then I took their brain in a whole different direction. Like, oh, it's not his girlfriend. It's his mom. That is like ba the most basic. Like Who you are having an actual relationship with. It's Jerry Springer style. <laughs> you could go even darker. That's what I would say. Hey. <laughs> yeah, that no, would be the marketing. No, 100. And, button on it. And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the so my tension and release. It's music. Right. My point is if the audience knows the. the <laughs> my point is if the audience. What's tension and release? <laughs> Musically, it's the same thing. Music is about building tension, cog uh, dissonance, and consonants. Like uh, you're building tension, and then you resolve. Like the drop of like a beat. Not quite. In a sense, I mean that's in a very exaggerated way. But all music functions between tension and uh, and like uh, what you call it, like cog c consonants and dissonance. Like between building tension and then you're grooving. Can you, um, ser I'm not serious. Yes. Here. Can you give an example musically of of how that would sound? But you understand what I'm saying on a, before you do on a mm -hmm. comedic level. If you heard the story enough times, then it doesn't trigger That's your brain. Guitar. Yeah. It doesn't. It no longer. Um, Second one in. Yeah. It no longer will trigger your brain in the same yeah. way to have that reaction to the joke. Smash the camera without breaking it. I'll show you what I mean. Um, I I will say. But you're telling me music's exactly the same way. It is a different. Uh, it's a it's a sibling to comedy. It's it's in the same family. Um, it's a different person. Right. Has different qualities, it's but a it functions. cousin. But like, if we were in the South, they they would marry each other. But if we were, <laughs> <laughs> there are different things. But the point is, like, home, stable, right? This is sort of where we where we're at. We're establishing the premise, then we're going somewhere, and then we're what's going on? That's the tension. And you're kind of saying, "What's happening here?" And then you punch and hit if it lands. You know what I mean? So I look at it. So it is tripping the brain. I just don't realize it. Um, 
What's what's a pop song they do that on? Um, give me a song. Bruno Mars song. Just do like Uptown Funk. Uptown Funk? Um, Is that a bad example? I don't know music. A, uh, con- a country song? Uh, Live Like You Were Dying. You know that country song? What? You know the country song, Live Like You Were Dying? Live Like... No, no, no. Live Like We're Dying. I'm thinking no, of Tim McGraw. It's a different song. Taylor Swift song. Who? Taylor um, Swift song. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> I found out about Did that with, with the beach. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Like, What I mean is like, when you're telling the joke, watch. I'll just play it. and Give me a joke. One of your jokes. The mom joke. The mom joke, right? Okay. She'd be like, oh, terrible. Hold on. This is like a sign language person, but for... uh, I never understood why musicians need 11 guitars, by the way. (laughs) Each one serves a different purpose. I know. That's what they always say. (laughs) (laughs) It's like... um, This is fun. This is fun. (laughs) This is is a challenge for musicians. You never have to tune in comedy. That's true. Um... Can you imagine if um, like a comedian out. was just like, wait, 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 can I try that punchline a little differently? <laughs> you guys will love it this time. So I just moved in with this girl. It's going really well. But now we're just like fighting all the time. It's not really working out, and I don't really know what's going to happen. And it's like, everyone's like, everyone's like, yo, you got to get rid of her. But I can't get rid of her. I love her so much. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, listen, guys. My mom's a great girl. <laughs> <laughs> now that you do it with it, I understand. Because Dimitri Martin does that with his jokes. That's he plays great, guitar. See awesome. what I just demonstrated? Yeah. I was kind of moving along. Then it got sad. And then you could say, um, my mom's a great girl. <laughs> I leave it hanging. But I still think I should date her. <laughs> oh, my God. And then instead of going home, I kind of, you know, but I still think I should date her. Uh, oh, God. What? Anthony Jessel. How would you play an Anthony Jessel joke? Every one of Anthony Jessel. I, 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 every one of his jokes is exactly the same. Though. Tuning on yeah, a podcast. They go like this and then that. Right. Right. It's and the, even that, when you're expecting the turn, it's much sharper. And than it you're always right. Anthony Jessel right. would always pro- probably end on like a, you know like a bit of a dissonant. You know what I mean? He actually has a joke like a similar Anthony joke. Anthony Jessel. You know the the one about why his his girlfriend's not religious anymore. How does it go? About the crucifix. No. How does it go? So basically, he says like. Uh, my my girlfriend has a crazy story why she lost her faith. She used to be um, she used to be totally religious. She grew up in this very Catholic home mm-hmm. to the point that her parents put this massive crucifix above her bed. <laughs> and then one and the reason she's not religious anymore. One night in the middle of the night while she was sleeping, the crucifix fell and left an eight inch gash in the back of her dad's neck. Yeah, I, I knew that was coming. Oh God! <laughs> so his jokes are always dark, you know. I'd always go, and then one day, you know, they're always, you know, like a little bit, like a little more nasal. I don't have a. And then his dad one day came in. His dad came in one day. <laughs> uh, I don't really know. I don't know how to. I, I wouldn't necessarily know how to script, but the whole point is, oh. tension and release. Works the same way functionally for comedy, for music, you're building, building, and then sometimes I find like Mark Norman, for example, stylistically, is sort of like the way, all right, as long as it's not in the shit, yeah, it's fine. Um, There are some comedic styles that are more like funk fusion, where it's super syncopated. Hey, yeah, there are also super, styles of comedy that have no. And it's super, I was thinking about it watching him on your show. I'm like, oh wow, his 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 comedy. Remember when you talked about how Pop, Giannis Papas and Louis, they get up and they riff on premises. And he was like, yeah, I don't know how you would do that because his stuff is so precise. So like so when, you watch, precise. when you watch like a funk band where every single hit is worked out and rehearsed, everybody knows exactly what they're doing when, it, there's precision. And it's cool and the audience grooves. And then you have jam bands. Right. right. Fish and people get up there with a premise, with a key that they're in. Everybody's locked into a groove. But what's going to happen is kind of playful and loose. Interesting. And both are music and both are legit. And the audience can get down with both. You're and then Seinfeld me. is like a classical orchestra where every note, everything has been perfectly fine-tuned, fine-tuned and crafted. And it's and, and he's talked about it, how the bits are the orchestra in front of him and he plays it, you know? And Norman's closer to that field where it's like... Right. Well, Norman's, it's, Norman can't do anything because of, he has so much anxiety. And, and he says, I just fill it with punchlines because I'm scared of silence. I don't want to feel anything. He's talked about that. Yeah. Um, but the point <laughs> is, like, if you watch it, then he'll tag this, I'll tag really that. Say. Ooh, eh, eh. It reminds me of funk music where it's like, 
Norman has Super horrible self-esteem. Precise. Yeah, can you talk about you? So you guys just interviewed Mark Norman. Mm. Um, he's like on the rise, probably top rise in mm. comic right now. I don't even say on the rise anymore. Like the guy is well, there. I'm saying he's on the rise to like major mainstream. He's yeah. like he's he's like almost breaking. So through. I call it there's legend status and then on the circuit legend. So mm. like legend status is Louis Seinfeld, Bill Burr. Chappelle, even though I don't like him anymore, but he's really funny. Why? We'll talk about that. We too. can talk about it. Yeah. I you have, have this like you're like anti Chappelle. I'm like, dude. Well, there's more. There's, yeah. Okay, we'll talk about Jessel it. Jessel yeah. Nick had a great line about him. Well, when but, we talk about him, remind was me. Was my musical comedy analogy? Did that make everybody? Yeah. Was, no. Was, you was that amazing? I, I was. I thought it was great. Yeah. Okay. Was that what we like? Well, that, that, that's our. That, that, that's how I. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about October seventh. So we're, we're gonna get there. Michael, <laughs> you are Dak. But, and... Oh, I was gonna. I'm sorry. I didn't. I just. There was a cool. There was something you were talking about um, before we get to the Mark Norman stuff. I, I want to get right back to it. Yeah. But you were, were talking about the rhythm of the punchline and how to set up the roller coaster thing. And I just wanted to say, like, when I noticed, I always had this question in getting into stand up, like, what is stand up comedy? Because there's funny people and there's stand up comedy. And there were two, like, defining moments for me. One was listening to Seinfeld on Tim Ferriss' podcast, and he says, Good stand up is good writing. Because like, Seinfeld's not a funny person at all. Well, it's like, don't be... <laughs> the idea is don't be fooled. It's not just a guy up there being a funny guy. Like, right. these are jokes disguised as either a vibe or this... Everything is a joke, yeah. even though... The, yeah, the, and you're writing, and you are... Good stand-up is good writing. I'm like, oh, okay, so it's such a simple concept. It's like, you have to write this stuff. Like, it's a craft, just like songs. You think people are just up there jamming. Oh my no, God. there's a structure. Most frustrating thing for me is when people ask me. So people, like, people ask me, like, so, like, do you just get up there and riff, or, like, yeah. you write your jokes before? I'm like... What are you talking about? They're like, no, because like some comedians are like, they don't like, they're not really scripted. They're just talking to the crowd. I'm like, no, none of them exactly. are doing that. And I've heard your bits, and I'm like watching. I'm like listening. I'm like, it's quiet out there. Boom, and then they all. I'm like, you really like your your stuff has, has a lot of tension. Well, yeah, I have a very like you're good like, in the pocket. Would yeah. anyone say that about com comedians? He's good in the pocket. You're, you're, pocket I use in a musical term I you're, love that term because there's yeah. a lot of anxiety yeah. in the first yeah. 30 seconds yeah. and, and uh, like good, the crowd is like this isn't going to be funny this isn't going to be funny this isn't going to be funny and then it is and, then okay. it is. and that makes people feel good I, I think that's what you mean when you say you have presence you're, yeah. you're, we're not comfortable by your discomfort while we're uncomfortable we're like oh he's he has this he's going somewhere with this he's okay Right. So I'm okay and you run out this like anxiety clock on, on the audience where they're like what where's this going <sighs> and that's right, yeah. And oh, that's, well, I'm anxious until the first joke hits. I'm very yeah, anxious. I can't yeah. tell. After the first joke hits, yeah. it hits rolling. Yeah. Right. And if it's not the first joke, it's anxious until the second joke. Okay. I, I noticed the second moment for me of like what after kind of cracking what stand up kind of is is when you stand backstage at a show and you're like going to go up soon, you hear the rhythm very clearly, and that's the other musical component to it. Like you hear the seasoned comics versus the people who struggle. The people who are getting up there and, and doing well, like have their not just people talk about comedic timing, but it's like they 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 are delivering and pulling back, and there's this rhythm going on that you become cognizant of and notice when you start to hear like proper. I would say like stand up that's effective and that's working. Um, you definitely do that really well, and then I start to hear like one well, this guy's killing it, and this guy's sort of like unintentionally fumbling. It's because like the audience is losing the rhythm; they can't lock in. It reminds me similarly of when a band gets up there and they're not tight. They just lose the crowd. People are like, I, I can't groove to this. The drummer's sloppy. Bassist is not locked in. And you're just like, uh, like the audience just starts to tune out, walk, schmooze. Like that happens to stand up too. Right. You know? Yeah. Mark Norman. No, we were talking about. So, oh, <laughs> you're saying uh, there's categories of like. Right. So there's like, legends. there's like legends. Oh. Like, yeah, yeah. So like that. Yeah. So like Chappelle, Seinfeld, Burr, like whatever. Like, and then there's, I mean, then there's something in between, which is like. That haven't been enshrined Where, yet. Where's in Nate Bargatze in this? Is he so Nate Bargatze, Jim Gaffigan? Mm. Um, who else would be? They're that? adjacent to legends. They're adjacent to legends because they will be, mm -hmm. yeah. but they're still like Joe Rogan. Rogan's a different category to He's himself. A, fair enough. Okay. Because he his, changing the game. His podcast, yeah. his podcasting life just MSG, like way right. way surpassed whatever his comedy career yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. was. Enough, yeah. um, that they're like in between the circuit legends. Circuit legends, I call, are like. Like Gillis, Schultz, um, I would say like Theo Vaughn still doing clubs. Anyone who's still doing clubs on mm -hmm. the regular, anyone who you could still go to the Comedy Cellar on a Tuesday night and see for fourteen dollars, but is also touring mm -hmm. and doing um, and doing specials at the same time, is that like in that in between stage? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's like in between them, like Nate Gates, you you'll never see the Comedy Cellar for fourteen dollars, but he's not on Mount Rushmore. He's not Bill Burr. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Nate Gates is an interesting example because. 
I'm very I'm my model my I'm very much yeah. like the sarcastic low I'm an idiot kind mm. of sell the crowd on there like I'm a dumb like you resonate with Nate yeah do you have you have a Nate Park Gates not internally no okay. I'm sure I could it, it's, it's probably one of the like, whole... is it southern and my family there was no cursing is it really southern does it's a little there... Lindsey Graham uh, it's Lindsey little, Graham it's a... hoodies um, <laughs> it's a little less I than... actually I told you I don't it's have one of the it. hardest ones to do because Atlanta. it's such a regular Atlanta. freaking voice but I, I just there's something about him it's very like deadpan and there was no cursing in my house it's very su- very right. subtle southern accent I actually just don't have it I don't okay. have it okay so leave me alone um, <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, I'm right. actually like he's a lower energy kind of style that's not my personal right. preference but Wait. he's a good I mean, it's tight. But what I wanted to ask you is, what what was it like to talk to Mark Norris? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what's he like in person? Uh, same same guy he is on stage. He has very low self esteem. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the most humble guy you ever met. Mm-hmm. Like, just like came into my apartment mm-hmm. and like drank tap water. I'm like, do you want like a water bottle? Yeah. He's like, no. <laughs> I was. I got. Yeah. He's. Do you remember when you did stand up for Israel the first yeah. show? Mugging into a bit of dome. Yeah. He was a... like 40 minutes late, and we're like, where? Are you? He's like, oh, I took the wrong train. I'm like, you have four Netflix specials. Can you take an Uber? <laughs> he's, he's like, like no. Nah, he's subway, faster. Subway's faster. You know, sometimes yeah. you're an Uber. It's an Indian guy, and he's like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. He poked me in the belly. He was just like, hey, so he's, fatty. He's, he's at that level constantly. There's no like. He he, he doesn't turn it on. To get there, he's just there. Oh, his persona on stage, yeah, he is like that. Yeah, like that. no, he's a very like he, he's yeah. a very low confidence, yeah. low energy. Oh, right, you met him. Right, we, right. You could have asked me this at any point, but you didn't want to. Well, That's he fine. talked to him for like two hours. Yeah, I, know, yeah. I know, I know. But yeah. um, yeah, he is huge match. He is. Yeah. He doesn't turn that on. He doesn't turn that on. I think he just performs as himself, but like puts his, but the jokes are. Uh, I love he... it because I also like I've struggled with like low self esteem and like to see someone that. Never even conquered that, but still made it is very comforting to me. I'm curious. I mean, that's fascinating to hear you have low self esteem because you have your parents are like are like pretty like renowned parents, right? Like they give like parenting and like. Oh, it's not their fault. It's like it's like where, where it's, do you, yeah, where do you think it comes from? Because I because I have kids, and I hope they have good self esteem. And I think to myself, well, if I if I do my job, they'll have good self esteem. And then, I'm, but then I'm like, well, I guess even if you're like one of these parents, it's getting it's better hard, like you know? it took me a long time to figure out exactly yeah. what i am so i was failing at so many things and just thinking like i'm like stupid and not going to be successful at anything and not realizing that like i'm just not an accountant i'm a stand-up comedian uh-huh. ah so you were in a, an environment good. that made you feel like a failure mm. well this yeah, we should really talk about this gets back to like the mm. jewish community and like they're there are different types of people in the world there are accounts and then there are creatives mm. for a lack of like nuance there and the creatives until very recently and it's getting better but very slowly in the from community didn't really have a spot. for sure Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. didn't Sorry. really have a place <laughs> um i thought it was a fascinating conversation you had with the last filmmaker ben younger yeah, yeah. because i describe would describe it exactly as he said it. he like took the words out of like our parent like my parents generation and probably your parents generation was either survivors or the, the kids of survivors mm-hmm. and to me survivor doesn't mean just like I used to think we call them survivors because they survived the Holocaust, but it's more than that. That defined their entire life. They were surviving. Their whole life was about surviving. Mm-hmm. So like my dad, for example, Destin, like I'll, Destiny's Child, my grandparents' favorite song. Right. So my my <laughs> yeah. my dad, for example, one of the reasons he's very supportive of me doing something different is he became a ra- his parents did not want him to be a rabbi. He went to the one of the top engineering schools in oh. in Canada and and he left wow. and became a Rosh Shiva. Um but his parents were always preparing for the next Holocaust. Like you have to have a profession, you have to have money, like all these things. And to a large degree, the Jewish community at post-war, which yeah, you know, we're like probably seventy years later, but we're but my parents' generation is very much post-war. Was just like we have to survive, reproduce, survive, think, don't become mess successful. around with don't guitars around. and stand-up comedy. That's yeah. insane. I, I think some th- something yeah. uh, non-Jews don't understand is how present the Holocaust is and is in every totally Jewish don't every understand. Day. My, I, and I'm not the, the grandchild. Michael has very drama. little street cred on this, but yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, my my parent, my grandparents were in America already for the Holocaust. So my mom's and, parents were also. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So my, that wasn't my story, and the Holocaust is still present every day. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't. I shouldn't say it's present in my life. I have like. No, no, in, no, in, in unconscious ways. President in the opposite. Is, is my dad had such a upbringing of like his whole community was children of survivors. Mm-hmm. And he was like a reaction to that. He wanted a very jovial. But, but even a reaction to that is right. Is having an effect. Presence in your life. But so, so you were saying though that. Um, but now, like our think, like our parents have money and we mm-hmm. have time, and like 
there is we're slowly like creating open. space for the it's gotten creatives. a little more open to like be able to explore passion creativity right unfortunately the creatives of the pre- previous generation just became like mashkicha I and mean, like tuna fish <laughs> stories like <laughs> <laughs> no it's sad but like those guys tuna could've, fish stories could have been like well, my dad used to say casually to me all the time. He's a lawyer, and he'd be like, "You know, when I was going to music school, keep the eye on the ball." Yeah, well, well I've told you that, <laughs> yeah. but he also would say, "I'd catch him. Yeah, I could have been a writer. I could have been a comedy writer. Yeah, I, you know, I could, I could, I can really write." Anyway, I enjoyed my money. No, he, <laughs> no, he would just <laughs> count my money. No, he would be a bit counting. You know, could have been. No, he he would just say like, it just wasn't. It's like it wasn't possible and it wasn't an option for the survivor mentality they were in working class families and wanted to get out of that and that was the ambition to like produce kids and success right. and because success i think was deemed only possible financial success was deemed possible with certain paths right. and certain careers um i'm curious you're saying like you were put in an environment where like law school accounting these kind of things i am not this person and therefore i'm i'm holistically a failure creativity was discouraged in Yavno, where I went, and mm-hmm. Frisch, where I went. Like, ben, ben Younger mentioned that. I don't know what it was like 10 years after, but, mm-hmm. like, we were, like, very implicitly said, like, don't draw. Don't As don't write saying, creatively. Don't do it. You're not allowed to. So well, I, only to serve that you can be well-rounded to get into a good college and get a good career. Yeah. It was, like, but, all to, like, be, if you want to do band, if you want to do this, it's good. It would look great on your college application. To be so my of house was a they, they would say that sometimes. Like, that would be... That, it, only if, in that if, framework. If you were already doing it very well, they would say, continue doing it for that reason. Right. But, but I mean, there but, were but extracurriculars in school. You just weren't good at anything, Michael. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there were... There was band. There was stuff. There there were those things. True. I'm, they I mean, were they, hobbies. They were... They, they were yeah, maybe they, I'll tell you... Yeah, my experience of it. At least at least in, in elementary school and junior yeah. high, there, there was no extracurriculars, and right. it was actively discouraged. Uh-huh. Um... My house okay. was like a, yeah, was a bastion yeah. of creativity, so I didn't really? have that. Yeah. How so? My mom's extremely creative, mm. phenomenal writer. Wow. Right, like I mean, she was a she was a Talem teacher, but like everything was done with an immense amount of creativity. Wow. Um, and my sister is is was an artist, phenomenally talented artist. Ah. My brother, a graphic designer. Like even the ones that that like what pursued more traditional yeah. paths. Everyone. Is but you were saying your so, comedy didn't get any. What was the word? What? Indulge. Yeah, why did Fargin? you feel so yeah. out of uh, so fargand? So not fargand. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like my- fargand. Why did you feel fargand? <laughs> <laughs> fargand. No, I'm just saying my th- that wasn't fargand? like in a serious way. My my siblings just yeah, like riff, riffing and ribbing, ribbing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they just all think they're the funniest person. Yeah. Wait, wait, but but why did you feel like you had there was no? Place that was more from no, that wasn't for my parents or my family. That why did you I have community. to go to law school and I have yeah. to be I have to do this real straight edge stuff? Because I did like I like every other Jewish kid. I just did the math. I was like, right. I want this many kids. I want a Jewish wife. I want yeah. tuition. All these things. I was yeah. like, there's only this doesn't happen through comedy. Right. And I still don't think the math works, mm-hmm. but. Like I don't, in my mind, like I don't have a choice. Like this is this is what I want to do. And right. you ended up going to NYU Law, right? Yeah, I did go to NYU Law. And what was the decision like to go and then drop out? Um, the decision, like my family's like mostly rabbis, so yeah. I didn't want to be a rabbi. Um, when you're like in that environment and you want to do something else, you you just go to law school. Like I mm-hmm. I enjoyed the process. Like LSAT came very naturally like to a, me. It's a great law school. Did you start people to feel work. smart at that point? Yeah. Sorry. No, people work really hard to get into NYU. That's yeah. Not... The day I got into NYU law, it, it a light bulb shifted in my head, and I was like, Oh, you are above average intelligence. And you're not like math smart, but this other there's another yeah. smart. I it, it was like, I still didn't have self confidence mm-hmm. at that point, but um, yeah, it definitely was a monumental shift, and then, and but. I hated law school. I mm. loved getting in. I loved taking the <laughs> test. I loved um, doing the networking. I went down to NYU. I like buttered up the professors, all these things. That was fun for me to chase. Mm-hmm. But like they're reading through the cases and like all the people in law school. The first day of law school, I sat down and we, we were assigned this case. I didn't read it because I don't know how to read. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> I don't read things. Which is really impressive that you got in not knowing how to read. That's amazing. I got all my questions wrong on reading comprehension. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so I sit down next to this guy. This like classic. Do you have this in Braille? Yeah, nerd that like went to like Cornell and like had a startup in Silicon Valley and sold it yeah. and was on his third career just for like shits and giggles. Was yeah. in NYU Law, and he turns to me. He's like, "You're not gonna believe this, but the case they assigned us has a typo in it." And I'm like, "Is that it?" He's like, "Yeah, like they assigned this case with a typo in it." And I'm like, "I'm like, I can't believe I have to like pretend to like you for the next three years." I'm like, "I cannot be in this place." <laughs> Bro, 
this is nuts. He and I was like, like he wrote is twice. And I'm like, the, and he's like, it's in a law school textbook. I'm like, I'm like get me. He so that was that was here. day one? He sounds like the one. kind of And you're of like, guy. I got to get out of here. Um, I mean, law school was a different. If I went to law school now, I would have enjoyed Did it. Did you get I, a JD or you dropped out before? No. No, I totally dropped out. But I was also a lot from her and I wasn't engaging in the culture. Mm. And that's a, yeah. always a recipe for a disaster. That's, I wasn't uh, like going out with friends. Yeah, that's I how I was like in grad school. Also, and I, I was regretted. hanging out with like the yeshiva guys and like, uh, I was like, you know, like just yeah. walk around like white shirts. It's this. And, oh, interesting. And, and you need help in law school too from your classmates, right? Yeah, I just like on a camaraderie level, you just like need like yeah. it's just a very lonely thing if you're mm. doing it by yourself. So how long did you make it? I just did the first semester. I dropped out during the second semester. Really? Yeah. Mm. What, what were your What was your parents' reaction? Um, thank God. I mean, like my parents understood more so than anyone else. Everyone's like, everyone I bump into until this day is like, how did you drop out of NYU law? Um, I just like there was like a mental health component to it. I was having like like panic attacks, anxiety, mm. and mm. I my parents. My parents were like the biggest proponents of dropping out. You should have said, they said, why did you drop out? You're like, it was a typo in the first case. <laughs> <laughs> You're not believe and this. I'm like, this place is not up to par. Now I rewrite place the is not up to par. Like, well, they hate Israel. I couldn't. I had to. <laughs> oh, well, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. He's that, a hero, not a bum. <laughs> um, did you know where you were headed? Or you no dropped idea. out without a plan? Oh, I dropped out. I, I probably watched, like, I binge watch House for the first couple months. That could take hit. years. It's a long series. Um, and then <laughs> I sold insurance for a little bit. Oh, that's a, that's Hamish. And yeah. then I did real estate for about three months mm-hmm. while I was doing comedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I was like, no, this is what I want. I, we started with the uh, with the two year too poor to be in Israel for Sukkis Comedy Festival. Yeah. Like I produced that show, and yeah. the rapidness with which it sold out indicates to me like there's a market for from yeah. comedy that could hold me over. So take me to that now, where you're at as a not only a stand up comedian but a producer of comedy shows, which is a whole other thing. Yeah. That hustle, oh. I was impressed. Like. You can fill rooms and push yeah. tickets. Yeah, yeah even just, without followings. Yeah, right. And, and a kind word to you, you were saying before um, how there's more of a um, there's more of a Jewish comic scene right now. Yeah. I think that has a large part to do with you because there's only a Jewish comedian scene because there's a Jewish comedian audience. You need, you need both. You can't just right. have Jewish comedians. You need an audience. And I think you've been pretty instrumental in finding that audience and bringing them together so Jewish comedians can perform. Uh, yeah, I think there was like there's an element to the Jewish comic fans that was like an element to the silent Trump voter in 2016 mm-hmm. that nobody like was the people in the base madrash like were admitting to each other that they were watching Andrew Schultz's. Oh. Not even out of they love to laugh. <laughs> no, not even out of embarrassment. So good, like, so from, so from. I meet so many people in the Jewish community. They're like, by Very the way, I'm, I'm a huge comedy fan. Like, no one knows this, and like that's interesting. Mm. They're just like not talking to each other. Then when you produce like a Jewish show in Beth Abraham and everyone shows up, they're like, "Oh, I'm a massive comedy fan!" Like everyone's like, "Oh, we're all we all love comedy." Comedy. Yeah, I'm shocked by the people you tell. I went to one show. I'd I like to go to more. I just um, I haven't it's found. It's in Teaneck, so it's like far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but the the age and demographics of the people who are showing up to your shows are wild. Right. It's different because like they're older too. or they're younger. Or they're, like, like, they're older and firmer. Yeah, yeah. Like our parents, our friends' parents. Right. Because those are like like our generation is like the, like loves like Barstool and Andrew Schultz, and they yeah. think they like stand up. And then our parents' generation is like I was in Grossinger's in 1981 yeah, yeah. when Jackie Mason played for the Foist. I don't know if left the love, scene. Th- yeah. I love Bill Cosby. He's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, He's good. Do you know that's his joke? joke? No. Who is uh, that? that that's, yeah. I don't want to release it now, but that's like Donald has a joke. He has. We'll tell you after, but he's got a great bit on that. But the whole thing is like I feel like. Look, comedy and the Jewish community have had a sacrosanct relationship forever. Right. Like that generation that they used to watch that stuff too all the time. Right. It just, there's been this gap where, I don't know, like in the suburbs in Jersey, bringing it to these communities. Comedy got stuff. synonymous with dirty. Yeah, I guess so. In, in like, I guess the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. And like, and that was a good point. And the city also, it was hard to see comedy outside the city. Right. That's yeah, a, exactly. That's a big thing. Very yeah, so hard coming in, I, I also yeah. think guys like Modi and Elon building their followings in right. going deeper into the world, chosen Modi comedy Elon festival, <laughs> has yes. made it, has, has been... Uh, Alex Edelman also was very big. Yeah, there. yeah. And just bringing it up and be bringing it as, as more to the forefront. Has, has Modi been like in contact with you guys as a, one of the biggest Jewish comedians? Has he like reached out? Elon's and, like, more that guy. I, I know, I know. But Modi hasn't been, right? Not so much. I mean, I've, I've done a few things with him uh, in the past, but right. nothing on the circuit. He's kind of doing his own, like, like his own shows, yeah. selling out his own solo shows, as yeah. opposed to, 
with Elon, we've been doing more like uh, like a bunch of us on a bill. Yeah. Um, and Modi's been out there selling out rooms. I'm yeah. I'd love to see him support you guys. Yeah. One day. Be nice to see. Keep looking out. But yeah. I, I appreciated his. Uh, he sort of did a, a kind of a conscious strategy of like doubling down on social media and posting stuff and. I think that helped uh, build his own right. audience. Well, he was a, he's a rebranded, not rebranded. He was always doing some Jewish yeah. comedy, but he was like a a comedy seller comic, mm -hmm. a house comic there for years. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we had I don't a real know. career in Hollywood. He was on an episode of The Sopranos. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> no. Yeah, he was like he was like the scummy Israeli jeweler on The Sopranos. That's great. <laughs> I don't know if you were with us, but when we were like sixteen, we had, or at the comedy cellar as young kids going, I saw Jessica Kirsten and Modi do a set there mm. and they were they killed it was great but these were like right. there was no other way to see these people you would go back in the day pre-social media pre-smartphones and you'd be like oh I've seen this guy I think he was there here the yeah. last time I was here two years ago yeah. we yeah. saw this guy he's really good yeah. which is insane dude. there's no follow through and I remember Modi got up there and he and he knew that there were buckers like yeshiva guys Jewish kids in the back yeah. of the club Loves not it. going to see him necessarily but they happened to be there and at one point, he turns to him, he goes, guys, I want to show you a little trick. Watch this. You ready? Watch this. Baruch HaZadashem Amvarach. And the whole back of the room screamed. <laughs> and Baruch HaZadashem Amvarach. And he does the whole thing. He's like, wasn't that a nice trick? <laughs> and everybody was like, so confused. The whole room was like, what? Because they were doing... So Shafir does that also. I know, I mean, yeah, yeah. He does that in Jew. <laughs> he says, he's talking about, he, he does a joke about Bittal Bashishim to uh -huh. non-Jews and it yeah. works, uh -huh. which is the wildest uh, thing to me. That's a great comp yeah. for you. Yeah, what's yeah. the joke? How's it going? <laughs> but he starts it by by saying guys watch guys watch this because there's like 40 jews in yeah. like a room of 200 he's like we can have us like we can have like pig if it's mixed in with a certain amount of um of kosher food right. and you want to know how much that is watch this how much is it and everyone screams out 160th he's like i don't know any of them I promise <laughs> didn't plan that yeah so he does that same moment yeah, yeah. one <laughs> so exactly like so he's just calling out to the people who know but back then it was like you talked about it for months. Like, who was that one guy we saw that did the Aliyah in the club? There was no follow through. There was nothing. Right. There was maybe an email chain. Yeah. There was nothing to get on someone's new. Uh, it was newsletter. the craziest thing in the world. We went to the comedy cellar and like this guy. And then if you see them again joke. years later, I saw Sebastian Maniscalco at the Laugh Factory, and this was sort of in social media was happening. But Which I remember in L.A. in L.A. when I was living there, like or my first two one or two years living there, I went and we see this guy. No one knows who he is. Sebastian gets up. He goes, these people protesting. Who's making the signs? Do you know anyone who's made a sign? I don't know anybody who's made a sign. Who's, I got to work. Who's doing that? Like, who are these people? And it's kind of different now because there's so many protests and so many things. That That's actually doesn't work. I never thought of But it. back in the day, he's like, do you know anyone who's ever made a sign? I never made a sign. Who's doing this? And we just, like, we were cracking up. He had this whole, it was the first time anyone seeing his style. And then... A couple years later, his like Passover bit goes all over social media when TikTok starts to blow up, and he goes, "We should have Italian skater to Passover skater." I go to my wife; she's Jewish. We sit down. I'm starving. <laughs> I'm starving. She goes, "Good. Well, first we read for two hours. Two oh, hours. You got literature. <laughs> I'm Italian. I need some bread in my hand within two seconds of sitting." Down. And he does the whole thing. Food's terrible. Crackers. <laughs> anyway, that starts to make his runs, and then Sebastian becomes kind of like. Fa pre famous, famous, and then he's yeah. selling out the garden before everyone like knows his name, and then everyone knows his name. Yeah. But the point is, back then, like you'd see these people, Dalia performed that night. They didn't have podcast infrastructure yet, they didn't have social media yeah. presence. I saw Theo Vaughn at a random club once, and like there was no follow through, yeah, they were just like random ago. experiences. That's not that long ago. Even, the craziest thing about comedy is you even, can see your, you <laughs> even can see 10 your years ago for $14. What's and that? Intimate That's awesome. You could, yeah, 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 in high school, we used to go to comedy clubs all the time. That's yes. what we did, and yes. I, I need to get that back in my life. Yeah, and we'd see, we'd see these guys yeah. before when they were just we, seller comics, we like saw Todd Barry a lot. We saw Rich Voss Attell. a lot. Attell. Rich Voss is still through. very much on the circuit. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's doing stand he, like twice a week. Among and, comics, mm -hmm. he's obviously very well respected, but I've never seen him almost anywhere outside of a comedy club. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if he's broken that bubble. It's either. Norman's at the no, stand all the time. Has. I mean, guys are just still working out their stuff. They're still the same process right. before so like, you take it up. Norman has an interesting thing. He explained to me he's that. He's addicted like, to he, comedy. He, I was like, why do you do like that? Why are you coming to my spot in the Upper West Side for like 20 Yeshiva League kids? Yeah. And what he said? And he said, like, I could do 10 spots to Comedy Cellar every night, which is like what Schultz and Gillis and Shafir do. He's an animal. material. He's like, I want to see how it, this joke hits in a black room. I want to see how it hits in a Jewish room. I want to see how it's mm -hmm. in a Mexican room. Right. So it was, like, very interesting. That's mm -hmm. the process. They're just obsessed with it. Like, yeah. comedy addicts, which I, I appreciate. That's amazing. Do you yeah. think it shows in his, or do you think his jokes are 
It shows. Yes. Yeah. He yeah. actually posted to Instagram um, yesterday a fully, uh, the full development of one of his jokes where he was mm. in the oh, car, thought of it, that. did it at a yeah. one show, did it at a second show, like it through five Have shows. Have you seen a set before? That. Have you seen Mark do it? Do a set? No. Have we been to one together? No. It's very different. It's like so different. And it's so tight. It's 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 like watching, a, to me, I can use the analogy again, but when you watch a funk band like Wolfpack or something, you're like, this is so tight. I can't look away. It's so airtight. There's no fat mm. on these jokes. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Yeah. He's not like, he's there's the, it's just like, oh, and you, and, and you can't stop until the set's done because every couple of words is a punchline. That's how I find his stuff is so dense with punches that you're just constantly, constantly holds you. That's that's my praise that's for his amazing. material, where you're just like, oh my god. He's got no no family, no girlfriend, right? He's married. No, he's married. Oh, he's married. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he wears a ring. I don't know. He's like eight kids, <laughs> no, a couple grandkids. No, he's married. More recently, I think in the last two years or so, he got married. But that's anyway, more, any of the guys who are like real writers, real writers, where it's like. And Louis C.K. is the same way, actually, because I find Mulaney's like he's a real writer, also yeah, yeah, very yeah, tight. With these guys, it's just like you know, every line is yeah. intentional. Does Mulaney go to the clubs now? Have you no. seen him? Mulaney's in the Bargatze. <laughs> yeah, Bargatze tier for me. He won't. He won't go to workout material at. I mean, he might go, but if it's the type of thing, if he goes, it's a surprise. It's like, oh my god, John Mulaney yeah. stopped in. Wow. Right, Chappelle. Chappelle. How could you look? I, I'm I separate agree. the craft from the person. He's okay. a guy, he's a comedic hero. He's on the Matt Rushmore. But you're very quick to say, "Dumb with Chappelle." Why? I'm not done with him. I think he doesn't like Jews. <laughs> I'm saying I'll, I'll watch his next special. I'm with you. The I think the saving grace for him is he's a, like a devout practicing Muslim. Mm -hmm. Before all this, he has ties to Louis Farrakhan, who is the yeah. most noted anti-Semite alive. Yeah. I think he means what he says, and I, I, you almost have. It's not like some like. Not just what do you mean by that though? Man. To his credit, you're saying. He's, it's it's not like a liberal, ignorant thing that he's no. saying. I think he actually well, means it. Let's just put one thing out there. None of us, obviously, know Dave Chappelle at all. And we are responding to the theater of someone, first of all. Yeah. So, like, it's always fun to just say, like, well, here's what I think about such and such person. And I have found, like, when you meet people and you experience them in, as a real person, that affects a lot of things. So, like, we have seen him through the lens, let's just be honest, of so media. We, all right, we might be defining anti-Semitism differently, though. I my think, my I point think is... I think could love me and still be an anti -Semitic. We had a conversation... Okay, we, we had a conversation recently. And, you know, I let you speak. <laughs> I let you speak. But he, he, with, with Rabbi David Wolpe about why Shito. we're failing the campaign of never forget anti-Semitism, making people aware of it. And I asked him, like, how do we avoid... How do we, on the one hand, keep people aware of anti-Semitism when it does show itself without people getting fatigued and sick of it, and then it loses and has diminishing returns, loses its impact when you call it out? And he said something interesting. He said, like, we have to stop using the term anti-Semitism so loosely, so quickly, and throwing it at everybody who says something that may upset us or says something that maybe needs correction or worth engaging with and stop using it and throwing it at everybody. And, like, to simply say, Chappelle doesn't like Jews... I think is very low, is, is low resolution, respectfully. Like a guy like Dave Chappelle certainly has had unpleasant interactions with Jews in his career, and probably many, many pleasant ones too. And I do think some of the things he said in his SNL monologue, I was critical of, and it sort of highlighted that I there's wasn't critical of those until after the Boston. Show. I was at the time. Well, actually, I was. What? But my point is, people who've had I've had unpleasant interactions with many Jews, as have you, as have you, and of course, many enriching, pleasant reactions with Jews. I think Dave Chappelle's been affected by that, but to, 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 to say like he hates Jews, quad Jews for being Jews, and has he been influenced by hostile people who feel certain ways about it? It's possible, but I don't know. Like, and I'm not playing dumb. I'm also like just not throwing out the word. He's not Richard Spencer, and he's not Farrakhan. It, it, in David, in Rabbi David Wolpe, Schlito's, um, Schlito. in, in, in his framework <laughs> of two types of anti-Semites, yes. you can hate Jews and you can hate the Jew. Yes. I think Dave Chappelle would fall at this point would fall pretty squarely in in hating the Jew. But it's a classic joke about what's the difference between a Jew and an anti Semite, right? Uh, an anti Semite hates the Jews, but like my accountant, great guy, my lawyer, oh, he's the best. He's such a mensch, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Jews, the Jewish people are the best. There's nothing like us. We help each other. This and that. Every guy you sit next to next to him, oh, that guy's a schmuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he hates his specific Jews. Right. Well, what happened in Boston? Because I'm not. So no one really knows because you're yeah. not allowed to record. From what I understand, it was um, 
not right after October 7th, but a few days in. He just like went on a rant on Israel, like genocide, all and, these things. And, and people like, stormed out. People, people stormed out. That was the, that was that was Here's what was alleged. That was what was alleged, and people don't have any recording of it. Could have happened if it did happen. That would be unfortunate, and I would be uncomfortable with that. But my, yeah, it's kind of like Maimon Harsinai though. Six hundred thousand people don't don't imagine the same lie. Uh, are, are you are you trying to? You don't want us to. I want Chappelle to like me. You want to like, no, but you, you don't want us to falsely accuse him. So then, when a real anti-Semitic, I just mean like sh- of all the things, um, uh, in all seriousness, of all the people to like really worry about, and who's like the enemy of the Jews, Dave Chappelle. I I can't even put him in the category. These are the enemies, though. That's why I disagree with you. I, no. These people influence the public yes. public opinion. Someone like Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle a, is a finely the most crafted yeah. anti-Semitic joke. I, I'm not worried about him, but, but someone like him, I think, could do the most damage. They weren't jokes. He did not say one joke in that whole rant, though. In 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 the, in the Boston, one? the what was reported from Boston. Yes, there yes. Were, he, he took a stop in the middle of his show to go on a rant on how he doesn't like Jews. hundred percent. If that happened, I can I, I I get it. But we don't. We're not commenting on something we saw. Um, and so I don't know the. I just don't know. I can go. I can go. Kind of be like a little All bit right. neutral on that. But the SNL but thing, I criticized have... where the SNL monologue he did went from jokes about Jews that were I thought were very funny, then it was no longer funny, to then like serious comments that highlighted a certain blind spot where he said like, you know, Jews have been through terrible things, but you can't blame that on black people. And I'm like, I know we're not doing that. It's Kanye who's blaming all of his problems on Jews, and therefore uh, Kanye West, like we we've talked about that too about where his anti-Semitism stems from, and I thought I think it stems more from mental illness, not to apologize for it, but he's obviously also going through a mental breakdown. So it's hard to judge those things as serious statements. But what's crazy is how many people resonated with his comments as if they were serious. I don't think Dave Chappelle comes from the same place. And I think it's weird to throw out a blanket term like that. I'm not saying he can't be harmful or, or, or it doesn't have the power to do that. But I do think, I don't know, like, do you really, really genuinely believe that? Like, I, I genuinely believe yeah. he, he probably is aligned with like the Farrakhan... Whatever attitude that is towards what Jews. Is that oh, I think he believes he doesn't hate Jews. But deep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my thing on Ugh. anti-Semitism. I've said this to you before. Yes. Yeah, so what's, what do you? What's a what's a racist cop? If, if 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 you have a cop that lives in a mostly white neighborhood, yeah, and a thousand and sorry, nine hundred ninety of it is a thousand pullovers are from black people, right? But they all were speeding. They mm-hmm. all did have drugs in the car. Yeah. But it's just like wildly disproportionate. Mm-hmm. I think that's still a racist cop. Really. For sure, if he's only pulling over, <laughs> uh oh! If he's only pulling over black people, even if they all there, there's something called like. I never thought the Dovey episode would get us canceled, but here we go. Um, what? Do you, no, he, he's saying. Ah, I think he uh, is racist. That guy. I don't. Yeah. Uh, if he's disproportionately pulling over people of a certain color, yeah, you'd say just by the optics alone, just no, by the way think, that looks, that cop is racist. He lives in a mostly white neighborhood, and he happens to only pull over black people. If he lives in a mostly white neighborhood, how would that make any sense? That's my point, because he's a racist. <laughs> okay, well, then we're getting into some things. If, so you say he works in a mostly white neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that would be weird. Right. No, that's my point. But that's Sorry. not what's happening, and whatever. My point but, is the, way, the same way the United Nations like a, a, accuses Israel of... A million you're saying actions speak louder than words. Like you could tell yourself, "Hey, I don't have a no-. like." You exactly. may there might be a gap in your self awareness, but if you're only singling out Israel for criticism, you may have a problem with Israel. Even if every war crime the United Nations accused Israel of was exactly true, mm-hmm. they have the, the, a, they had like the I forgot what the number was. They have like double the the combined war crimes they've accused Yemen and Tunisia, and North Korea, all these countries over the whole years. I more, get it. More than double that is Israel. Okay, so like, fair point. It happens to be the smallest country in the world. That's There's run a gap in Jews. your self-awareness if you say, hey, listen, I have no problem, but you're only criticizing Israel yes. Jews. I get it. Or Dave Chappelle was silent after October 7th, and then after the response from Israel is when he like lost lost his shit all of a sudden. So like, it, it, Maybe anti-Semitic is, is not the proper word. Prejudice. Semitic Sorry. suspicious? I, I think he has, a, he has an issue. Semitic with, suspicious? He has an he's, issue he's with a prejudice. I don't know. He has prejudice. prejudice. Is that fair? Prejudice. He's a subconscious no, prejudice but, towards but, Jews. But Farrakhan, the, the, the like black Israelite thing is more than just a prejudice. They have... Farrakhan's not a black Israelite. Nation no, of Islam. But, but, but they, they use a lot of his like rhetoric, I think. No? Farrakhan gets up there and says, I'm not anti-Semite, yeah, I'm anti-Turmite. Like he's he's the, explicitly anti-Semite. The somber guy says, I'm not an Aronian on Zalman. I believe, I believe he is nation of Islam. I, have, I actually have no idea. I don't know what the difference is. I don't know what exactly. the difference is. I don't think that's what I mean. Um, part of it is like, I, I, we don't. I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know that. I'm, I'm being honest. Like, I don't know what his affiliation is with Farrakhan or the Nation of Islam in that that sector. I know I was it. so worked up about this before you brought it up. You? <laughs> yeah. No, but the point is, like, I have trouble believing that somebody who has, and I, and I, I, I don't like the idea. Deja Bell has been suspected as an anti-Semite years before this. I don't like the idea of telling somebody they feel something, 
that they don't profess to feel. How does that make any sense? Well, society's built around that, right? Like we, we society ha- like has rules for and incentives for like things that you yourself. What do you mean? Don't know about. I'm trying to think of like Mur- murder. It's the, called what, unconscious. Well, the bias. difference between manslaughter and murder is like yes. you wanted to do it when you yeah. did it. And and I and I'm making that judgment based on all the evidence that is premeditated. You actually wanted to kill that guy. No, but we're judging. Listen, at the end of the day, I think we can boil this down to actions and words. Like, how does somebody act versus what they say? I get it. And while I don't want to put beliefs in somebody's head that they don't profess to feel, I also don't think the actions really add up that much. I think it's a little more complex. And sometimes, I'm not trying to be a total apologist, but I'm also just like I have trouble believing that of all the for all the real Jew haters out there, like. I don't think Chappelle's the one to worry but, about. But I think I think Jew hater is different than it was in like 1939 or whatever. Like there's there's a new type of anti-Semitism that that is worth acknowledging what it looks like. It it doesn't look like you're you're flying a swastika and want to put Jews in camps, but it might look something like like what you're hearing around Israel and ceasefire. Right. Anti-Semitism I, has never historically, I know this isn't my idea. I think this is like a famous essay from Ray Soloveitchik that like it's never it's never been a society has never come out and says like we hate the Jews let's round them up and kill them. It That's has, not true. It it's never started that way. It has always started from an institution, right? Either it was Bris Mila or Shrita. In our generation, it's the state of Israel. It oh because it's very hard to rally a civilized society around hate of a group because people are inherently much better than that. So you have to um, appeal to their morality. So when the Nazis said, you know, the Jews do this like child mutilation, they do this this animal cruelty thing, so people are like. We're standing up for morality. Uh, you have to appeal to people's better nature to hate. Exactly. I understand. So in that. our generation, it's the state of Israel. It's open air prison. We have to. We have to tease them. He into could have it. finished law school. This one. He's, he could have finished. <laughs> no. Um. That's an interesting point. That it starts incrementally, and it starts by appealing to people's better nature. To you know, the good nature. You know, the yeah. Jews in Nazi Germany are vermin. They're like yeah. a stain on our side. They're impure. So we have to purify. Right. And, and it and, uses the language of compassion. And but that's even true. more than that, yeah, and the uses, economy too. They're hurting the and economy. And that Well, hurts. Christian anti-Semitism, you know, they killed our savior. There's like uh, the Christ-killing libel. Yeah. They're doing me. They're doing evil things. Not they're good, and we have to kill them. And we need to be the bad guys. You're right. People don't lean yeah. into that. But and, and Israel's an institution. I Israel's like thinking an institution. about it that way. Look, do you yeah. remember when when Whoopi Goldberg's fight was kicked off the View for a few days, suspended? We talked about this on an earlier episode, and I said, I, "I'm with you. I'm with you generally." And it's like, and, and she said, and she said when she came back in her apology to her about it. Like she didn't know. She clearly showed a gap in her in her uh, awareness yeah, I don't and think ignorance. Goldberg's an anti-Semite. Oh, I do. No, I'm kidding. No, she's not. Goldberg. I mean, come on. She said like uh, the Holocaust was not about race. But then she, when she came back on to apologize, she said, "I said what I said, and I regret it, and I apologize for it." And I'll, and as far as the Holocaust goes, I'll never speak about it again. And I'm like, that is not a win. It's a win for the ADL. Pat themselves on the back. They feel virtuous and good that they got somebody canceled for saying the wrong thing. This is counterproductive. Like, Whoopi Goldberg's not the problem. She didn't know something. So ignorance is easier to fix than hate. You got to, like, you know, talk to somebody about that. Um, But, like, somebody saying something that reveals a certain, like, the Nick Cannon thing. Like, a lot of people in this, in the sort of the Dave Chappelle world who have, like, maybe had negative encounters with Jewish people, like, calling out something they already believe and punishing them for it can't be the way to do it. So I don't know. I feel like if it's just sloppy. What do you call and it? And it can't be fully true. What do you call it when you're summer? downtown in Soho and you see a, a Free Palestine rally? And yeah. There's like a ton of young black kids. Right. I'm 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 not saying they're anti-Semitic. I'm not saying Whoopi Goldberg's anti-Semitic. But right. like, what 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 are we gonna call it when like in in a certain community in a certain culture it yes. seems like being a, anti-Israel is like is very mainstream. I don't I don't know what to call it. But but I think it's something we should acknowledge so we can properly address it. And you're right, not canceling them, but but I don't know what do we do about it. Like I, I think what well, could, I think well I would I would I would say like if Dave Chappelle was Roger Watersing it out there yeah. consistently, then I would say there's more legitimacy to the claim that he's got that that the way with Roger Waters has has a problem with anti-Semitism and has anti-Semitic tendencies. But I don't see Chappelle doing that. That's what I'm saying. And you're basing it on this incident that happened. Fair enough. And that was sort of the tipping point for you, right? Yeah. Like what happened? Well, that made me that made me like re rewatch and rethink I, his other things. I guess I'm just not seeing that. Dave Chappelle in that. I mean, I, we keep coming back to this, I'm but not, like yeah, not he's s- not out there as Roger Waters yeah. at every Free Palestine rally, yeah. like going I, after I, things. So I'm just like, 
save this for the people that are as like that 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 earn it. I, I'm less interested in Dave Chappelle specifically because I also I, I don't even know that much about it. But yeah. I, but more generally, people like him who are saying things like him. But also that. But what, he's got a plenty what, of affection for does, Jewish does people. Does he need to hang a bloody pig from the ceiling to be like Roger Waters? Like what else does he have to do besides? That would help. That would help me easily <laughs> more clarify. contend. No, but I agree with it. Like, but you're even saying, in his opening in the SNL, he grew up in Akron around a lot of Jews. He's like, I want to get off tomorrow. It's Shana Nanama. Just he was trying to first set up the premise. Like, I have a lot of affinity and, and he's affection. Because he's not a moron. He no, but knows, I, he, he I think that was that genuine that, that he has a lot of affection for a lot of Jewish people that he grew up with and friends of his. I don't know. Well, if we had Jeff Are Ross. Are you into that excuse? I hate that excuse. If we had Jeff Ross here, if we had Elon here, if we had people here who have actu who have actually worked with him and. I'm. I'm sure. He, uh, it's what the would same they say? Thing. I'm sure. I'm sure. But you, he, so you subscribe to like I have a gay friend, so I can't be homophobic. I have a black friend, so I can't be racist. I, I, I don't, I'm not if you think about that, if you were truly homophobic, it would probably be very hard for you to have a gay friend. But Rabbi Wolpe <laughs> true. Homophobia is a, is a fear of gay people, or or. So it would probably be hard for you to have a genuine gay friend. No, Rabbi Wolpe think addressed about it. exactly. I understand that. what you're saying. I just I like you can have a gay friend and still hold prejudice against. I don't the gay like community. the idea of saying I have a gay friend and that excuses bad behavior. I hear you. Which but is what it's if, used if for. Somebody Yes, but if somebody was truly a racist or truly homophobic, it would be probably hard for them to have genuine friendships with gay I, people and I black people. I don't think so. Well, what, what do you say to Rabbi Wolpe who says there's the two kinds? There's people who, who hate the Jew and can just, and can have best friends being Jews. You don't think Hitler had one Jewish I think friend? Rabbi Wolpe's point on Jew versus the Jew, I didn't quite resonate with. I, I think he's saying exactly that, where he's saying, I don't have a problem with individual uh, uh, Jews, but there's this thing out there yeah. that I'm going to, that is the conspiratorially Jew. and working against me, and I and I choose to call that thing the Jew. But none of the people he's talking about do that, and that's why I pushed back when he said that. I said, they, they, they don't, I don't like telling people they, they feel something do, that they don't feel. They don't do it directly, but you can infer from what they're saying that So the gap in self-awareness, he made an interesting point there, but I will stand by the point that if somebody has a genuine friend who's black or because Jewish, of, they're probably not anti-Semitic or racist. I don't. And if somebody was truly racist, I don't agree with that at all. Because yeah, if you're walking, if you're, if how you, could how could would would a KKK member ever be like like the most unapologetically racist person? Have a friend who's is black? Slave slave owners had like their like their nannies were. They love their nannies who like breastfed them and took care of them. They own slaves. Also, racist doesn't mean like, hatred. It means treating two, two different groups differently based off of prejudice. I think semantics-wise, racist means No, because if you're downtown in the city at, at one in the morning, prejudice is different than And you than see racist. a white guy walking down the street, and you don't cross the street. Everybody, good people, bad people, have prejudice. That's a very different thing than racist, I think. We're just like, if we're talking about semantics, like... To believe certain things about certain people or an individual person I think purely it's based on... Is it racist to believe that, that, that black people are more likely to commit crime? As an individual person, yeah. yes, I think that's a racist yes, thing. But to everybody exists with certain. You prejudices. can believe that and still have a black friend, so that then you can be racist by and have a black friend. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that's true. I mean, it's it's a very this is a very delicate type of conversation you, to have, but it's not. <laughs> it, it, if somebody look, if somebody goes into like in a, it makes certain assumptions on groups based on like walking into, uh, if someone's Persian and you make a presumption that oh your father or your family are your are your is your family in the in the shmata business? Do they sell rugs? Things like that. More likely than not, the Persian family would be doing that versus some white family. That's a prejudice, a prejudge about a person that doesn't have a necessarily negative connotation. You're inferring that based on somebody's right, that's an example group you're identity. Giving. That's not. That's not. Pre that's not racism harmful. to me. Racism to me would probably be things that are much more like uh, yeah, but negative here, or harmful. In this example, or, if you had or if, inferior, I wouldn't say inferior. If you had a racism owner, implies inferiority as well. If you, imagine you had a business owner that's not then, hiring then prejudice. That's not hiring black employees yeah. because he thinks they're more likely to steal from him than white employees. Mm -hmm. Yet he has a black friend he's known for twenty years and knows he doesn't steal, so he trusts him. So he's the one black employee in his uh, in his company. Yeah. But he doesn't hire any other black employees at all. Hundred employees because he thinks they're more likely to steal. Right. And he says. Well, I can't be racist. I have a black friend. Yeah, because you know him 20 years. You well, still hold this very negative prejudice against it, black people. I would say if you're getting really fine-tuned about it, he if he was attributing the fact that they st steal to their pigment of their skin, it's that it's because they're black that they steal, that's racist. Well, if he's judging that a certain that there's a disproportionate oh, amount of crime within a certain community that's happening, that's prejudice. It's it's different. He's not saying if he were to go as far as to say it, He's saying because of the pigment of your skin, I, I, I believe you are more likely. He has extrapolated a, a certain prejudice, but he's not. Yeah. If he's saying that 
it's the fact that they're black is why they steal. Like it's inherent to their race. Well, no one Do you see the, the genetics difference? of the pigment of the skin is what causes you. That to is take. not no, true. No, Racists believe that. I think that's what a racist. Is that's what a racist believes. Racist. The, the, the immutable traits that you are born with determine but, your behavior, your beliefs, your culture. But, but I think that's people, real racism to me. And a lot of other racist, things are based on racism. prejudice. What? I think they're both racism. All right. Well, it's like semantics a little bit. But I would say that well, by if we're going by real definitions here. To believe something about a person based on immutable characteristics that will determine their culture, their so behavior. You, I understand. So, so you're saying that it can never be changed, even by the black guy I know for 20 years, not to be a thief. What? If he was a truly a racist, he would never be friends with that guy. That's what you're saying. Correct. Because he would say, I object to the fact that you are black. Can, can I bring it back to Chappelle? That would be a real racist. And therefore, I understand what you're saying. I think, I think you, I you will never that. eliminate prejudice from people because prejudice is based on human experience and human interactions. People prejudge based on the experiences of how we navigate each other. And sometimes prejudice can be wrong. Sometimes they can be... And sometimes they can be lean more right and lean more wrong. But you're not attributing culture, behavior, and things like that to someone's race. Can, can I bring it back to Chappelle for a second? Sure. Do, yeah. do you think he believes certain things about the Jews strictly because they are Jewish? Like the Jews are committing genocide and it's not because they're Israeli and it's not because of the context and it's not because of the geopolitics and everything. They're doing it because they are Jewish. What a huge question! And well, that's, that, that's so, kind of the question: is is he anti is he anti Semitic? And does he believe Jews have well, certain like, characteristics that are that are causing them that I, are inherent to being Jewish? I that can't are imagine to, he believes that. I don't know if I believe that either. Yeah, about I mean, him. About yeah, I don't, I don't know. If I don't. I, I can't imagine. I don't know if I believe that. that either. But I, I but know. I just disagree with you on the pre like. I don't. I don't. I don't need it to now get, you, you, get to that. To now, for the, here's where I will agree. I think we both agree. There can be behavior that's problematic and kind of racist without the person themselves being a racist. In other their words, beliefs are racist. Either their beliefs or the fact that they're behaving in a certain way where you're like, hey man, do you realize the double standard you're setting here and that's pretty racist? Without saying you, original sin inherent, are a racist human being. The way like a proud KKK member would say, I am. Somebody who's like, who is racist, like, wouldn't have no problem admitting it. Right, but at the end of the day, if they're committing racist behavior, like, what difference does it make to us whether or not it's coming from something deep seated? Because or, at the end of the day, it's, it's irredeemable. Somebody says something or says the wrong thing or does the wrong thing, they are now labeled with this original sin. You are this now. And I think that is probably the real problem Don't around. Say labeled. <laughs> oh, sorry. To say that somebody is something that they claim not to be, I think is a starting point for more conversation than it is. And it doesn't apply in every case. Some people, the behavior just is so out. Roger Waters, I don't think there's much excuses left that you could like, I don't care how many Jewish friends Roger Waters have, I sort of get it. I guess I just, as a matter of degree, don't put it in the same category. We can sort of put a lid on this subject. We've been going at it. But I'm just saying like, if somebody's like, no, I don't feel that way. I really don't. Like, I have no problem with Jewish people or this people. Why do you keep saying that? Well, because you've been behaving. This. Oh, that's interesting. I did, we're like making somebody aware of that. I hear you. But like, racist behavior might be different than somebody being a ideological racist but part i think part of what makes spell special is it's his his art and his profession is sitting down and thinking deeply about the things he believes and right. talking about them on stage right that most people things that come out of their mouth right that's a very good point they believe that right that's his so job should be held, is to to, think, held to a higher level I and i and did we had a whole episode where we talked about like where he was like really missed the mark in his thing that was disturbing to me yeah that's very different still categorically than someone who is just like in a a, you know, committed anti-Semite. Yeah. The thing that bothers and me, and I want to use the word a little with a little more precision, so that when we do see it, people don't go, "Ugh, anti-Semitism." I don't throw it again. around a lot. I can't think of one other like famous person that I call out for yeah. being right. Right. Yeah. I'm not saying you. I'm yeah. just cognizant of it in a way, and yeah. and yeah, it's hard. I have a lot of a. Uh, I have and a lot I'm, of admiration for. Chappelle. I'm biased the other way. I would much rather he not be an anti-Semite. Yeah, yeah. I love the guy. It, it it hurts me deeply that I believe that. Jesselnik said something interesting about him lately. Maybe also because I love Chappelle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he, he hasn't gotten away with a lot of his BS lately with trans and some of the anti-Semitic stuff, the yeah. Jewish stuff, because when you... Pe pe people laughing is getting away with it. Yeah. People haven't laughed at his stuff hard in, in, in long enough that like... That the main talking point is that he's anti-trans or anti-Semitic. Did you see his trans joke that killed in the most recent special where he talked about no, I stopped, Andy I stopped Kaufman? I watching his specials. His, I, haven't, I haven't thought they were I didn't watch the coach. I watched the, the clip. But the Andy Kaufman bit. Yeah. Did you talk about that and Jim Carrey? Did you see that one? I think if people were laughing It was amazing. Did you see point, it? No, I'm not sure. To your yeah. point. If, if no, I agree with him. He was making he jokes into and, and we were all joking. We I laughing. love Jewish jokes. I love I love. He's how, not joking though. They're not funny jokes. There's a di no, you're right. When he wasn't, I wish he was joking. When he wasn't joking, it's a problem. Yeah. But you're saying people aren't laughing anymore. He made them one of the best bits of trans yeah, jokes ever. What was ever. it? What was it? 
You don't want to say I it. I could say it, yeah. Uh, it's, on, it's on Netflix. It's, on, it's out. Yeah, what is it? No, he basically said, like, I got the opportunity to meet Jim Carrey. One of my idols. One of my idols. <laughs> one of my idols. I don't do a good one. Dan Soto does it better. Um, he said, I got the opportunity to meet and, uh, to Jim Carrey. But when I met him, it was on the set of a movie about Andy Kaufman. And... Man on the Moon, and he was playing Andy Kaufman, and he was method acting. I'm butchering the joke, but he's like, and he was method acting, and I went in there, and I was so excited. I was like, Jim Carrey. They're like, No, that's Andy Kaufman. And the whole time, I knew it was Jim Carrey, but I had to pretend like I was watching Andy Kaufman, and it was cool, but I know that's Jim Carrey, not Andy Kaufman. All this is to say, that's how I feel about trans people. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah. knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. I, I, yeah. No, because I because you it's told us before it's a joke about trans transparent. People. No, I got well, it. Well, I gave it, away so the punchline before <laughs> the bit, yeah, no, it's and I said what was coming. And if you watch the clip, you're like encapsulated into this long story. And yeah. you and what he did that was so brilliant in the joke was love you, Dave. What he did that was so brilliant in the joke was that really, you keep he, on turning like, to the camera like love you, Dave. Is like whenever I'm like on camera and we're like it's like someone's ripping on like. An attractive girl in society yes. for something. I always defend her and I'd be like, "By the way, if we ever meet you, I love you." <laughs> I just remember this, um, Kim Kardashian. I defended you. <laughs> me, me doing that was my thing for a while before, anyway. But uh, <laughs> so he takes everyone into this world where it's so yeah. obvious. Everyone agrees, like how he would feel in that scenario, yeah. and it was a brilliant move comedically because everyone's like, "Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's how I feel." Like we all know, you know. Anyway, that is to say, it's a great joke, and any joke about any subject, I'm good with Jews. Any group or whatever. When he gets serious and starts making points, that's subject to a different scrutiny. We've covered that. At the end of the day, I just don't want to throw around the term so loosely that it loses its can, actual effect. Can I, and if you're actually really good at something, you can get away with anti-Semitism. Can, <laughs> can I switch topics so back to comedy for a second? Yeah. That story. I heard a great story that I so rarely get to tell about how Jim Carrey landed Andy Kaufman. Um, he mm. wasn't. He, he was like still sort of like in his like early like serious acting days. Well, Cat yeah. Williams was saying he, he, he's yeah, left he's with the producer. Sick. You don't even know the meaning of these words. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. It, you act like you don't even know the meaning. Do of Do people these know words. what a plant even is? <laughs> a plant. A do you see Cat Williams doing this? Do no, you, you see don't. That? I said I'm not dressing up like no grandma. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he dresses like? Why do you you act like you do not know the meaning of these things? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Cat Williams. Anyone from any, if you work in insurance, you can go on a podcast and talk shit about. Everyone in the insurance industry and a million people will watch it. Yeah, something is yes. so it's so captivating. Easy. You know how many views? It's so easy. That v I, I was What's it up? forty What's million, it up? fifty million. No, 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 no. I I checked it last week, probably yeah. beginning of the week. Was yeah. at fifty six million. Wow. You know, to put that in context, Joe Rogan, who probably has the most popular podcast in the world, Elon his, Musk. Right? Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. His Elon Musk interview was at thirty two yeah. million. Stephen A. Smith said. When it was at around eight million, he said this. He thinks this is going to be the biggest podcast episode ever in history. Well, here's he what I think. Right. I I appreciate what Cat Williams. <laughs> I appreciate. I appreciate it. what he's doing. I would never speak disrespectfully <laughs> about <laughs> anybody. I'm trying to get it down, but that's, I don't know sports, so bad. I can't talk about these subjects. You bad. act like you do not know the meaning of these words. Oh, Cat. <laughs> oh, Shannon was like, "Oh my God, stop, stop, stop right now, stop." Kenan it was so, it was so amazing. Kenan was growing more and more yeah. comfortable. He's like, "Is, is he was like, gonna be public?" He was like, like, "He was like, oh dear, oh lord, stop, 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 cat, oh cat, cat, you, what you doing?" You know what I oh, just, come on, man. Oh, come on, man. I just made this connection. Does a Shannon Sharp remind you of Ben Parker at all? Ben? A little bit. No. Oh, cat. Oh, cat. I don't know. I don't ben. Know. Oh, you don't know Ben? Oh, yeah. Tommy knows him. Oh, cat. No, no, no. Oh, oh, stop. I want when he goes. I want when he goes. Stop. 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 It was one, so great. One thing it did remind me of the Cat Williams interview, which is very relatable to the three of us. You guys yeah. went to like Yeshiva League schools, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it reminded me of like a Yeshiva League kid getting cut for the from the basketball team. Mm -hmm. And then like one through one going through every kid that made it and like why? Like <laughs> his, his dad's friends with the president of the oh. school. He's on the board. He got in. This kid, like, he went to camp with the coach and he saw him play all summer. Like he just like it was very had it smelled like that to me. Was there anything yeah. on the Andy Kaufman thing you wanted yeah, to wrap oh, up? Sorry, so, yeah. so I'll tell the story. So, so, uh, so <laughs> and then they, we can go right to Cat and we can wrap so up. So Jim Carrey really wanted that role, um, and they weren't they wouldn't give it to him. He's so, a plant. So he called <laughs> up the producer and he said, "Just come over to my house. Let me let, let's just talk about it." Yeah. Um, and um, and a, a lot of comedians were talking about it. like they were all sort of vying for it, 
And 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 when Jim Carrey like knew he had to compete there, so called the producer. He said, "Come over to my house. Let's let's just talk about it." He brings him to the basement. He pours him a drink, and he he puts on some old SNL clips of of Andy Kaufman on SNL. And he goes, "I just gotta run to the bathroom. Wait here. I will come back with we'll all that." So the producer's sitting there watching Andy Kaufman clips old from like from Taxi and mm-hmm. SNL and all that. And and uh, and Jim Carrey comes back down. He goes, "So like, did I get it?" And he's like, "What are you talking about?" And he points uh, the screen. And he goes, "That's me. That's me." He re-recorded all the clips and put the like old film filter on it or whatever. What a brilliant move! As himself as on government, the producer didn't even realize. That's how he got the job. Then uh, the buttons us around the red carpet. They asked this other comedian who was like supposed to get it, and they said, "They said, you know, like you know, he was at the premiere or something. He's like, you know, how come? What happened with you? How come you didn't get it?" And he said, Jim Carrey called him up, and said, "Don't do the movie." And he talked shit about everyone involved. He said, don't do wow. it. We're, none of us are doing it. Don't do it. That's how vicious he is. Jim. It's so sad. Isn't that crazy? I don't know because I'm still like that. Please, with- if you can't take away Chappelle and Jim Carrey from my adoration in one episode. I, I, you have to respect it. You respect it because you're kind of evil. shallowness of like the, when you get exposed to the You also just don't of- know what's true, honestly. Yeah, yeah true. I... I I'm not saying we I've been in the game, but I'm just, I'm not trying to put myself in anybody's like arena, but like I have had enough experiences a little bit to know like so much of what we process and consume has been filtered through a yeah, lens we all of theater make... and it's not true. The we... way people are, what happened between such and such, how things work and how, most of it's just like, oh, there's a whole other. But we all make know. decisions in our lives, all our decisions based on partial information. We never have the whole picture of anything. No, one's no I know. None of us read every st- story about the No, vaccines. so everything I hear is with a grain of salt. Almost everything. So we, we, like, at a certain point, you have to make a decision about, about about someone, I think. Yeah, so hearing that's fun, but I also, like, it also could always be in, in, uh, abundance. I know what you're saying. We, we don't have to yeah. go back to you. Yeah. Don't throw back no, up. I just think you. Yeah. Um, let's let's wrap you... up. Tell us about your hair. Oh, wait, the Cat Williams. Oh, okay, Williams. Cat Williams. Yeah. I just want to. My take on the Cat Williams watching how entertaining it was, and I'm curious to your response. Captivating to it. storyteller. Incredible. But I'm always suspect of the Kvetcher, of the one mm-hmm. who's complaining, the one who's bitter, the one who's bloody resentful. I, it's um, usually the loser. It's usually like, it's on you, man. You didn't get those roles because of you. For what? Like, I, don't know, I don't know the story, but I'm just like, it's, it's really off putting to me that when someone is going, that person's a plant. Kevin Hart has to sell tickets. Yeah. People come to see Kevin Hart. Yeah. So like he can't you can't manufacture that. And w- what he's saying is is Kevin Hart is incredibly skilled at networking and building relationships and making compromises to have that large of a career. And Cat Williams can't do it. It's not a conspiracy. He doesn't have the skills to do it. Okay. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm with but, you. But he's calling him a plant. Like That's his career was already made as if the, as if industry manufactured him. Right. No. People find Kevin Hart funny enough to buy tickets and go watch him. It yeah. might not be for me. Right. It might not be so, for Kat. And, and but a, I give credit to people who are successful because you can't manufacture it. But what about the joke stealing stuff? Do you think that there, there's accuracy in that? Like the Steve Harvey joke stealing Cedric Entertainer? That, yes. I will. That's, that destroys what was What was that part of it? Just refresh me. Because I wasn't watching. Um, just watch he, that. He, I think he just accused, uh, he basically oh, accused oh. them oh. of stealing jokes. And like putting them out on the, as their own. Uh, I know that that happens. Mark talked about that too. That it's rampant. And like, yeah, I, I'm I'm okay with calling out like malicious behavior, not people's success and hating. I'm not cool with that. Going out and saying he doesn't deserve it. Like he's not saying Kevin Hart did. Saying somebody did something wrong and calling out somebody's ethical transgressions. Yes, that's different than complaining about people who are more successful than you and don't deserve it. Right. You know, like to me, that means like I happen to do love Cat Williams, Cat Williams special. I, 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 I and he's great, but like, what, what does this do to say like Steve Harvey shouldn't be successful? Clearly, people have found a, the the people have the power. People have decided they love Steve Harvey enough to want to go see him and to want to go to his show. You no, can't. You just can't manufacture this. If he's Michael, stealing jokes. Michael's cooking. No, he said, he said Earthquake can't read, which I thought was the funniest part of the whole thing. <laughs> what did he? He went like, like Earthquake says he... he, he talking he, to You know why he yeah. didn't get it? Yeah. He can't read. They realized he can't read the <laughs> teleprompts. <laughs> Figure, but, but you know how My I look at that? My favorite thing was <laughs> Steve Harvey <laughs> insulting. He's like, the, yeah. there are 30,000 scripts. <laughs> there are 30,000 scripts. <laughs> how ain't none of them come for a country bumpkin black dude who <laughs> don't <laughs> read good. And looks like a potato. And looks like Mr. Potato Head. He said he, and he's bald also. That's that's a wig. Who? He said Steve Harvey oh, had, early had been days. bald forever uh. and he was putting on a wig. Fair enough. And in spite of all of those handicaps, Steve Harvey is where he is. 
Well, but, but, Matt's my but, point. But, but I'm saying. I'm, so, I'm, like, what are you complaining about? Like, it's it's off putting. It's entertaining, but it doesn't reflect well on Captain. Oh, uh, I like it because it was very human. I like it because it's fun, but at the same time, you like, were a no name comedian, and Steve Harvey came and sat in the back of your comedy club and then produced his jokes on your own. You would do the exact same thing. What do you mean, and then produced his jokes? Meaning, if he came to and stole my jokes. Yeah. That's I said I made a distinction between theft and somebody's success. So that's what I love. And cats seem to be also complaining about people who just aren't funny enough and they therefore don't deserve the comedy. You can not like it subjectively and say it's not for me. I don't think it's that funny. But props to him. He's he's found an audience. Like that's the way right, it really works. I also love the interview, the, the human side of like I because like, yeah. no one will do that anymore today. But, you have but, to respect everyone. And you're in I, Joe Rogan calling out Carlos Moncia is is a great thing that he did that. Wow, well, remind me what happened. That was an ancient one of like the, the, the legendary beef was Joe Rogan oh, was unknown. Carlos Moncia was huge, but he was a known joke thief in the comedy world. Like going to people's clubs and people wouldn't do their set because they knew Carlos was there. And his name, real name is Ned. And he tried to play it off like he was Mexican, but he's actually from uh, Honduras. And his name is Ned. And Joe, I would always call him Ned. And like he 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 like worked with Bobby Lee and all these things and there was a whole beef and like Joe got banned from the Comedy Store for crashing for storming the stage. It's on YouTube. You can watch it That's for amazing. storming the stage with Carlos Mencia doing his set. He's like, dude, you are an idiot. You're an idiot. You're just upset because you don't have what I have. You don't have my audience. You don't have my skills. And Joe's like, no, you're a thief. You steal people's jokes. And he cuts Ari Shafir on stage and he says, you stole Ari's joke. You stole this joke. We all know it. And then he got banned from the comedy store for like 10 years. That's amazing. And he yeah. stood on his principle. That's not complaining about people's success. That's calling but out, that, you know, malicious and yeah, evil behavior. Right. How do you explain the 50 million, though? Is what it just mean? the name dropping? 50 gossip? million views. Because when, when, oh. when, when do you have a podcast like that? Where it's yeah, just, where's the guy trashing? Is it that much? Yeah, but I don't I'm know. sure we could think of... I guess it was like an hour and a half of it. Wouldn't it be funny it if it was a plant? It, it was, was a plant. Uh, the whole the whole episode was a manufactured. This is plant. what people want to hear. This is real drama. This yeah, is a, yeah. If you brought a rabbi yeah, on this podcast yes. and he and he called out by name specific rabbis for stealing his drusher material mm. and stuff like that, I probably you'll get a hundred thousand. You would get like a one point six k probably. Maybe I'm not in the game long enough, but I just find that the yeah, I just think it's <laughs> like uh, the whole idea of like he calls out Tiffany Haddish. She don't deserve it. Tiffany Haddish was a plan. You never, you ain't never heard of Tiffany Haddish until she's Monique. Monique. I'm like, well, these people get in front of people, and then pe and then they have to sell hard tickets, and then they have to be in movies, and people don't invest money in people who are. It's like it's not a ch it's a chicken and egg thing. It's like the person has to drive the tickets. The movie doesn't drive. The oh, person. I don't think he was necessarily right. I just loved yeah. the interview. It I know. Was so raw. It was so stop, human. Stop, Dovey. Stop. Stop. It's going too far. It's going too far. Stop. <laughs> oh my God. Stop. It was so funny. Um, but anyway, that's my take on it. That As much as I enjoy it, there's a part of me that judges it as a little bit like, dude, it's the anti-Gary thing. Like, you're just complaining about other people's success. This is very timely, six weeks after it premiered. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love that Shannon had, like, these cards. I was like, don't read off those cards. Just let like the, go. Oh, my God. I was trying to understand the physics of the couch also. Oh, I, I don't, really I don't, don't yeah. understand where it stopped and started. You do not know how a couch works, <laughs> Michael. The couches can be it's anything. Like staring at it. I was like, anything. what is this thing? It's a custom uh, Anyway, so Dovey, we've been going a while. Do you want to keep going? No, this no, this is this is fun. This was this juicy, great, very juicy. Is there anything else you want to bring up or yeah. promote uh, or anything? Um, what's next? What's next for stand-up comedian and producer extraordinaire, rising yeah. star Dovey Newberger? Um, things I can t talk about. We got Montreal uh, stand up for Israel mm -hmm. in Montreal. Yeah, you I'll be on going? that show. You guys are flying to Montreal. Wee oui, wee. Oui. That's exciting. <laughs> Very cool. So I mean, this we got. We're gonna get a little bagel that you hear about. We gotta get. Can we? Can you get me a bagel? Make sure there's bagels in my green room. I don't think Canadians make a bagel. Montreal, Montreal bagels. bagels is really? a thing. It's a thing. Yeah, it's oh a yeah. Thing. I've never been to Montreal. It's a thing. It's awesome. It's an awesome city. They have an ocean there. No, I'm just like kidding. Extend your trip. It's a really fun place to be. Uh, I said they have an ocean there. You didn't say. Uh, they do. Know. I think they're on the the coast. No. I have not. Coast no. of Canada. The coast of Canada. So there's no oceans there. <laughs> What the do you mean? It's on the, the oh no, it's in it's in it's in Toronto. I think it's it? Toronto. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it'll be fun. Yeah, we'll get that. So we got that <laughs> yeah. show coming so up. You're producing. I got a show tonight. I got a sh Saturday night. Uh, we're doing a show at Tid. Mm. Then Montreal next week. Um, working on something big in the city, which hasn't dropped yet. But stay tuned. Really, oh. something very big. Off pod. Um, you're on. Uh, you're the co-host of a podcast. I forget the uh, name of Joe. Are you on Instagram? Non-labeled. <laughs> non. non -la what is it? Called? Um, Dovey um, Newberger. Yeah, the, the, it's called Newberger. I think Newberger. <laughs> Co-host of Miss Label, keep going on the pod. You're doing great. You guys yeah. are making great stuff. Yeah, big. Um, really have been enjoying you guys together. I think mm -hmm. It's been awesome. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. That's a lot keep of it fun. coming. Um, are you on Instagram? Twitter. I'm on Instagram at Dovey Newberger. Need cool. those follows. Cool. Twitter. Mm -hmm. Check it out. 
I thought, uh, I thought you just said Nida's follows. <laughs> we, didn't hit, we didn't even hit those jokes. Yeah. Oh, man, we have a lot we didn't cover yet about the growing up in I have time if you guys want. I just, I, growing up in America. Oh, yeah, but you know what? Let's save that for round two. Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is Dovey Newberger in the house, partner in crime in the, uh, not partner in crime, but uh, fellow, tra- I'd say fellow. Tra- Ow, your ring. Yeah. Your ring. <laughs> fellow traveler, I would say. We haven't done a little thingy thing in a while. We used to do this for Ami's house. What's the finger thing? That's it. That's it. That's, That's it. what it is. That's what it is. You said you have trouble closing. We just closed. Dobie Newberg. <laughs>